scout leader. Yeah. So, if you'd all please stand while we present the colors, I appreciate it. Proclamation for Flag Day 2017. Whereas people across the United States celebrate Flag Day on June 14th each year. Whereas Flag Day is a day when Americans celebrate the meaning of their nation's flag, honor the traditions associated with its care, and educate those around them to its significance. And whereas on June 14th, 1777, the flag resolution was signed making the current Stars and Stripes the national flag of the United States of America. On May 30th, 1916, President Woodrow Wilson called for the nationwide observance of Flag Day. And whereas on August 3, 1949, President Harry S. Truman signed an act of Congress designated June 14th of each year as National Flag Day. He also requested that the President issue an annual proclamation calling for its observance for the display of the flag of the United States on all federal government buildings and whereas the city of Hagerstown, Maryland encourages citizens to observe with pride all ceremonies for Flag Day through Independence Day as a time to honor America, celebrate our rights and freedoms, and to publicly recite the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States. Having said that, can we please recite the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, I'm presenting the proclamation. Thank you. I'd like to recognize the Longmeadow Rotary Club. They're going to be having 20 flags on display at Longmeadow's Rotary Park. Um, this, evening they're, this evening, they're putting them up, and they'll be on display all day tomorrow. The Rotary Park of Longmeadow's on Northern Avenue is maintained through a collaborative effort of city employees, the Antietam Garden Club, and members of Longmeadow's Rotary. It has steps that go down to a small landing in the back of the park, in the back with a park bench by a stream which was erected as a memorial to one of its members, Dr. Ad Abdullah. This park has been utilized as a focal point for causes such as awareness of child abuse, where blue pinwheels are displayed during the month of April, and the Rotary's annual fundraiser, the Flags for Heroes, which raises money that gets donated to other local nonprofits in the area. So again, we encourage you in recognition of Flag Day to visit Longmeadows Rotary Park. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, young men. Appreciate it. It's time to lose this tie. <laughs> All right, next up on the agenda is a preliminary agenda review. As always, as I go through it, if you have any questions, please stop. Uh, we we'll have a call to order. This is uh, next Tuesday, 7 p.m. Uh, the invocation given by myself. 
Pledge of the Flag, our announcements, uh, the meeting schedules uh, for July. There'll be no meeting on July 4th. There's no meeting also on June 27th. Uh, no meet or the uh, uh, four o'clock work session on the 11th, four o'clock work session on the 18th, and a regular session on the 25th at 7 p.m. Last some guest uh, will be the Gridiron, Cl Gridiron Classic MVP, pre MVP presentation. Citizen comments, city administrators comments, mayor and council comments. We'll adopt the minutes of May 2nd, 9th, 16th, and 23rd. And on the consent agenda, the very first item is auditing services, SB and Company LLC, Hunt Valley, Maryland for 39000 Your information technology and support services, seven multifunctional copier lease renewal from WPS of Hagerstown, Maryland for $294,600. Uh, under Parks and Engineering, uh, Guard Rail Repair and Installation, LS Lee Incorporated, York, Pennsylvania, $43,370. For the Police Department, uh, Uniform Items, Northeastern Uniform and Equipment, Pittsburgh, PA, for $31,514.81. Robert W. Johnson Center, <clears throat> After School Program, 2016-17, for $17,940. The Justice Administration grant reimbursement to Washington County for $12,167. Under utilities, under water, we have meters, LB Water Service Incorporated, Chambersburg, PA for $81,970. Under water also, Gould's Pump Bowl, Geiger Pump and Equipment, Baltimore, Maryland, $16,970. And under water again, uh, change order to Edgemont Reservoir Engineering Contract. Potomac Appropriation Evaluation Permit, Hazel & Sawyer out of Baltimore, Maryland, $88,898. The Wastewater, Atlas Copco Maintenance Agreement, South Carolina for $118,639. Any questions so far? There's no unfinished business. That's good to know. Under new business, there'll be an introduction of an ordinance, binding interest arbor arbitration. The introduction of an ordinance, floodplain management amendments, which we'll discuss tonight. The approval of resolution, publication, subscription, and access agreement with the Commission on Accreditation for Law Enforcement Agencies Incorporated. An approval of resolution, community development block grant, fiscal year 18 annual action plan. A lease renewal for the state of Maryland, Department of Labor License Regulation for space of 22 to 6 North Potomac Street. Thank you very much for that. Uh, approval of the development plan for 43 to 53 West Washington Street, which we'll cover in a short bit. Approval of a noise ordinance exempt exemption from City Chapel. Just to make note that, that is for the rest of the summer. For the remainder of the summer, is it a specific evening? Saturdays. Saturdays. Are they the ones who are down at the. Uh, East Washington and uh, Canada. Okay, all right, saw me this Saturday. Yeah. Uh, approval of the R.C. Wilson traveling screen replacement, Carl Belt Incorporated, coming to Maryland for oh, $1,294,000. Approval of tree trimming contract for Hagerstown Light Department, all reliable services incorporated, St. Augustine, Florida, for $188,000. Approval of workers' compensation insurance, excess workers' compensation liability insurance for 156, 655, workers' compensation self-insurance, TPA services for 32,040, workers' compensation continuous security bond for 38,100. Approval of memorandum of understanding Washington County Mental Health Authority for Eggerstown Police Department overtime, overtime costs for crisis intervention training and the approval of non-union wage enhancement. So, any questions on any of the agenda, the consent agenda or, under, or anything under new business right now? I do have a question for, uh, I have one, and that is uh, the tree trimming contract. Mike? Thank you. <clears throat> Uh, 
<laughs> Tried to sneak out on me. <laughs> you almost made it. Uh, the tree trimming contract. Uh, all reliable services. They have a local presence, although they're in St. Augustine, Florida. Yeah, I believe their employees are semi-local. Exactly where they live, but. And that was a bid process that we they, put they out. That they were low bid three or two years ago. Two years, two years ago. I can, all their license plates are in West Virginia. If that means anything. Okay, well, just well, because no Aspen's a country. Uh, exactly. So I, I, that's why I was asking. Yeah. 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 And, and, and they have done an excellent job for us, or else we wouldn't be back up here. They say they're working for public works and parks also. And so the three of us share Good enough. Share the contract. Thank you. You can go now. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, okay. All right, next up on the agenda is uh, Hager 5, proposed development plan for 43 to 53 West Washington Street. And we'd like to welcome not only Jonathan Kearns, but also Greg Snook and John Barr, and the fantastic mayor of Funstown, Mr. Paul Kramer. Good afternoon. I want to thank all the members of Hager 5 LLC for being here this afternoon. We wanted to provide the mayor and council uh, an update on the Hager 5 LLC development plan for the property, potential property sale at 4353 West Washington Street. Uh, that is scheduled for approval during next week's regular session. Uh, just to, to go over uh, where we stand. Uh, the, the development plan as required per the contract was sit submitted by Hager 5 LLC on time uh, at the end of April. Um, we're still looking for uh, settlement to land uh, at the end of July of this year, July 31st. Uh, the city has some state grant funding work that is set to commence uh, any moment. Uh, some utility work, sewer lateral, uh, new water meter out front to accommodate a uh, upgraded fire suppression system. Uh, and also likely some asbestos removal to start uh, later this month or early July. Uh, once again, that's funded through state community legacy grant funding. Uh, we are still working through some MHT processes. Uh, there's also a, a potential uh, after settlement uh, issue with the easement that could be uh, worked out post settlement. Uh, I spoke with legal, uh, our uh, legal counsel, Jason Morton, similar to, uh, I believe, maybe even the county uh, and city transaction of the Massey property. Uh, there's potential where the easement may need to shift a little bit and uh, per Jason Morton that shouldn't be an issue we can work that out prior to settlement um, and once again uh, assuming settlement occurs uh, at the end of July I believe Hager 5 LLC is looking to break ground in roughly 2018 2019 um, but with that I'd like to, to hand it over to Greg to discuss where their development plan stands how their development plan ties in with the urban improvement project uh, and their projected investment of 1.5 to 2 million uh, at the property. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for being here in this nice room. <laughs> well, we didn't want you. Well, we didn't want we didn't want you to come from the heat in here and be overcome by the coldness. So, well, bless your heart. Work you into it. You did a pretty it. good job of it. That's for sure. <laughs> um, I believe you all have been supplied with a packet of information. Uh, it is. Um, very similar to what you received when I was here about a month and a half to two months ago. Um, there are pictures that are, are shown, displayed. Uh, in the packet, uh, you can see our development is divided into several phases. Um, the first phase is uh, basically trying to secure the settlement or start to settlement and then work on some uh, renderings uh, that are more detailed. Uh, to date, we have spent uh, approximately $30,000 on some due diligence work between architects and engineer uh, for this project. Uh, and our plan is uh, to follow those phases as we go through there. Now, one of the things that uh, I believe will be uh, explained a little bit later by some of your staff is in reference to the back of the building uh, for the plaza area. Uh, there is all the parties in the uh, downtown plan uh, have been meeting regularly to kind of coordinate different activities and one of the big uh, items that has come up is the plaza area in the rear of both of these parcels the university parcel 
and then also possibly behind the district court building. Uh, we are working towards with the county and the state on um, a, a more detailed design uh, to get cost estimates in. Um, so we are waiting on that to come back from the architect as we speak. Um, I do not have anything else uh, that I would like to say uh, in specific, but I would like to see if there was any questions or, or thoughts in reference to what we shared with you. The design that's on the front is pretty much uh, your common brick uh, that is there now. And the rear is a little bit different with glass and uh, uh, different metals. And the, the, the back is the new front, just very similar to like what the current university building is. Uh, this concept here was uh, done back when we were talking about the original BISFA uh, school project. So it has been updated. And that is what we are working on with uh, staff and the county. Uh, to bring in a more current design, uh, but it includes uh, uh, the rear of these buildings, uh, both to be also used for as a fundraising tool for the theater. So I'll open it up to comments or questions. And I think one other thing to note is ultimately uh, after settlement, Hager 5 LLC would still have to go through required processes such as the local HDC review. So these designs and renderings are meant to be high level and subject to change pending MHT input and our local HDC review. Should be in your packet also. Our plans haven't changed. The second floor is uh, uh, to be vacant at this point in time. This is the B building. Uh, hopefully maybe for another future expansion of the USM and or another business but then the third and fourth floor uh, we've tentatively slated to put in some type of dorms depending on the demand. That's the fourth floor there. Greg, um, can, we, can we go to the very last one? That's the last That's one. That's it. That's oh, it. Right there. Yeah, this one here. Oh, there it is. Yeah. There it is. Okay. Now, this, uh, where the pink space is there and the light turquoise, that is the first floor of the old Tom McCann building. 43? 40, that's 43. That is the one that will be demoed mm -hmm. uh, per our, our plan. And according to the contract, <coughs> excuse me, according to the contract, we were uh, uh, allocating at least a 10-foot right-of-way through there uh, for... Uh, access to the street and you know what our architect did there is basically an open plaza area uh, we did plan on putting doors in there but I know there has been discussion about some other thoughts and that's why I wanted to see what what you're what you're thinking right well at this point I mean at this point in time that that's our presentation to the council here gotcha I'll, I'll just go back to like April of 2012 uh, and discussions that we had uh, about purchasing this property back then uh, the thought process was to have an open area a pass through from uh, from from Antietam basically from, from the parking lot out there through to West Washington Street which dumps out directly right in front of the University of Maryland um, and to have it open, have it well landscaped, uh, a brick sidewall, a big, nice brick sidewall, uh, well lit and, and cameraed, uh, tying into our police department cameras. Um, that was a thought process back then. Uh, and I know things change, as they ultimately do. And I know that you have a return on investment slated for this, given the drawings that you have. I would like to offer a suggestion that we go back to the original concept as, as first conceived in 2012 and then find a way uh, to be able to uh, do something to help offset the 
loss of any kind of revenue you would get from those five. And I realize there'll be so many upper floors sure. too. Um, well, we could approach it from this aspect because we have not started the design of the rear of the plaza. Mm -hmm. Possibly, you know, I would have to talk with the county and, and you know, other city staff if we could have some of those renderings that or drawings that you had concepts at that point in time we could possibly import, incorporate that but keep in mind our preliminary estimates at this point in time just to tear down the building and stabilize it uh, we're talking several hundred thousand dollars uh, so you know I guess you know we're open to talking about that but uh, with this, you know, this was one of our ways of trying to recoup some of our investment at this point in time. But, you know, we want to we want to work with the city to accomplish, you know, your downtown goals. So, you know, we don't have any firm plans, no signed leases for any of that space at this point in time. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the phasing <coughs> of this here, I mean, we're probably not going to start demo till sometime next year. Right. I mean, and that can be, you know, we were hoping to use some of that space for actually uh, staging for the university project um, because, you know, there's going to be a lot of a lot of moving parts between what <clears throat> what's going on with the university and the Barbara Ingram and the theater. Um, I'd, I'd like to hear the council's thought on that, too. That's not your, I mean... Again, I can only go back to what was envisioned. Okay. Yeah. I wasn't privy to those 2012 discussions, so I... No, no, yeah, and you wouldn't have been. No. So there's a section in the memo that... Here it is. It says, although these plans are fluid, the staff feels the concepts approved by Agri-5 LLC along with the city's original vision for the property. So I guess the concern I have is I have a drawing in front of me and I have a report that says that at the end of the day, that drawing may not matter. Um, and so uh, when, you know, when I look at this rendition, uh, especially on the last page as it applies to the first floor, because I think for me, just for me, that's the floor that most matters uh, as it applies to getting something that says, yes, public, this is your point of, of access um, between these two spaces, you know, uh, the rear area and Washington Street. And, and so I guess I look at things like uh, where you have uh, this tenant five and you have this stairwell that comes out here. I mean, I guess I envision, you know, where I would be amenable to uh, kicking the staircase in a different direction and maybe losing that one tenant and opening that space up so that it, and I hate to sure. keep referencing bulls and bears, but so that it speaks to that process of, of this is I, you know, I understand what, you're, what you're thinking there. And the, the stairwells are only there based off what we're thinking about doing with the B building. Okay. Okay. The B building development is primary to mm -hmm. us getting any type of break even back on this project mm -hmm. in the initial contract it talked about an easement area so I mean I didn't put that in there that's something that the city put in there mm -hmm. uh, in reference to the walk walkway through there or the 10 foot easement going from front to back person so I'm what I'm saying is we're open to doing something but for us to invest several hundred thousand dollars into that property we would have to definitely have some more discussions with the city in reference to what you want to do with it, that's all. Right. I mean, we just, we wouldn't be able to pick up that entire tab because, I mean, I think I mentioned last time, we were, there's an elevation drop of several feet. Right. And that's why I said for me, like, I don't need this to be, I don't need this to be open to the air the way that uh, the one next to Bulls and Bears is. You know, because you got that open yeah. air walkway and then you've got the enclosed back, one. Back, back to and the I say that because unlike uh, the bulls and bears where you don't have anywhere else to go, you know, got to go around the block, you can at this time, you know, for me that improves the, the uh, um, uh, marketability of getting through Hager Row. All I'm saying sure. is, is if you could envision 
this being the enclosed sort of plaza place you go through and Hager Row being the open air place that you go through to get to that same point. I guess that's what I envisioned, okay. you know, If that, long if that ago. is the case that the council wants to go, then I think staff needs to have a talk with uh, Maryland Historic Trust in reference to the property. For? Because at this point in time, there's, you know, as far as how do you save um, that front uh, of that building, I could be wrong. Yeah, we're, and we're still in the process because of CDBG funding to mm -hmm. acquire the property and state funding that was used to also acquire, it was I believe a mix of CDBG and Community Legacy when we initially purchased it. Um, the original intent when we bought the building with that funding, we go through the CDBG environmental review process, yeah. which requires historic trust review. The original scope of work at the time assumed we would probably salvage both structures. This new plan, which uh, clearly to demo the one structure, uh, we now have to go back and edit our original mm -hmm. CDBG environmental review and re reconsult or I guess um, reopen the review with MHT. So MHT will be involved in the high level concept of what will end up replacing this, the, the demo. I guess I, I guess what I'm trying to say is I'm fairly good with what you have here. I would just like this, I would like this area to be a bit bigger and more opening. That's right. The way that, that, that Bulls, and then folks, because down at, down at the, the, the 28 South Bulls and Bears area, you know, um, you have that, that open walkway, and here you don't have that, or, or here you would use that alternative of, you know, uh, so the Hager Row. So basically, turn that stairway and cut that first rental space. And then open and this that. space up. That's open. right. And it would be, and it would become sort of an open interior uh, 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 plaza the way that the other one functions. Because even bulls and bears, when you go back, it skinnies down. You know what I mean? Sure. Uh, uh, as it gets back, back to the parking deck. I guess, and that, I envision it functioning just like that, where you'd go back. Because, like I said, I envision there being a parking deck back here at some That's point. Right. And so, just like the other one, it would work. This would be open air. You, would, you know, you feel invited to come in and walk through to get to your parking that's behind it. That, that's what I had thought about. And you'd have doors on it that would be open, <laughs> that would be accessible So to me, you only lose one, one tenant space, which well, is that. Yes, yeah, exactly, the, the yeah. tenant it five space. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, the doors would be, of this area would be accessible 24-7, maybe open. It sounds like it's what? two different scenarios that you were just discussed. That's, You're that's not what. Open that's not what I'm no. Okay, that's that, that's not okay. what I'm talking about, and I understand. Uh, and don't get me wrong, I I am no way, shape, or form, am the person that leads this charge. But I mean, I I have to. I mean, because Bulls and Bears is accessible. I mean, that walkway through is. We would not leave it open 24/7. I don't see how we could. Are those doors but, open 24/7? I I don't. I, don't I think seriously so. doubt it. Yeah, I don't think so. Yeah, I mean. Yeah, I just, I just can't see how we wouldn't be able to police that area mm -hmm. in keeping whatever. No, we don't keep the University Park open, yeah. you know, after like 10 o'clock. So, I mean, <laughs> after a certain that is period open. of time, I mean, the doors would lock and keep our access. Right. I think what I have most wanted to prevent is it looking simply like another sort of office front where it wasn't the inviting, you know, uh, extension of the, of that pathway through, because if you don't have that, then then the pathway itself gets lost, and you never make that link mm -hmm. uh, uh, to that plaza and, and the university. I guess you know way back in the day, I envisioned you know the university plaza, the plaza behind district court, and then a link over to the plaza uh, at the library. I mean, I guess that's mm -hmm. well, I kind of thought about it all along, uh, but I think you need that link through in some comparable manner. What exists on South Potomac. I can't hear what you're saying. Emily. I agree with Kristen about the front. If you were able to cut that ten and five and make it a bigger space, so you could tell it was a walkway, I think this is fine. Then. I think that would accomplish what you're trying to accomplish. Okay. Yeah, there's a there's a place down in. Uh, and I guess it gave me the thought process. There's a place in, in Chincoteague that 
you know, right down in town center, I don't know if you've been to Chinkity, mm -hmm. but, but it functions exactly that way. It's got the, the storefronts on the first floor on both sides when you go through, and then the areas above. Just um, to go back to what Mayor Virtue had said, <clears throat> and what you were just talking about as well, the, I guess, the possibility of a, a straight cut through, open air cut through, you said it's not really feasible, you think. Because mostly because there's going to be additional spaces on top of this, we had planned to put at least a second floor on top. On top of, yes. Okay. Yeah, I mean, we, you would not be able to build a building with right. just so chop those, that off, with those that little. Off. Yeah. Right. It, so you almost put a at least you would rough it in or structurally build it, not frame it out up, up on the second floor. I'm guessing the lot's about 35 to 40 feet wide. So, I mean, when you take at least 10 foot of that, sure. it, it'd be tough to do that. That makes because if you're losing your, your upper levels. Yeah. Right. Anybody else? Don, you got anything? Um, let me uh, say that I'm very appreciative of what you're doing down there. There wasn't exactly a whole bunch of people who wanted to buy and develop that building. Uh, and it's an exciting project. As people see that develop and change, um, they're going to be excited about it. And, uh, thank you for doing that. Um, I, uh, for one, don't think that uh, you should should design that building in a way that you lose money. That's not the point. Uh, although I'd like it, the path through there to be as attractive as it possibly can be, um, I don't think that uh, that's essential. Uh, what's essential is having a successful building that you guys want to own for a long, long, long time. So thank you. Part, part of our discussion with the back plaza involves district court um, you know whether they come the whole way back to the alley or whether they go sideways I'll call it sideways and until we get a little direction from the state I'm, I'm not sure if the staff has any more to add to that you know that's kind of what we're looking at because if you take just with what's if they come back to the alley in the open area that will be behind these facilities it'd be very similar or no, no wider, I guess, than what the University Plaza is, right. if you take the width and the length um, on that. So that's kind of what we've been strategizing with and going through that, and we talked about utilities and, you know, for in the back alley and everything. Well, all three so, of you, all I three mean, of you can... developers grew up in Washington County. <laughs> you had your successes in Washington County, and my guess is, you're going to be looking out for Hager Sound in Washington County as best you can. So thank you. Well, we we all believe in downtown. I know. You I do. think I think you know um, we want to we want to make the whole project the, the downtown urban improvement do. project succeed. And uh, you know that's it. I mean, there's uh, um, some challenges, but we can get through that. And uh, it's been great working with the staff. They've been very helpful and supportive. And uh, you know, here again. That is just our concept at this point in time. We're going to try, I mean, you have a 40-foot wide building, so I'm not sure how many variations you can put into it, but we're open to, you know, trying to make it work, you know, for both of us. Okay? Thanks. Okay. Thank you, Greg. Much appreciated. Thank Thanks, Greg. Thanks, Mayor. Appreciate it. Thank you. We still comfortable moving forward then with regular session approval? Looks that way. Okay. Okay, uh, next up is the action report, update, update on the implementation of the community city centers. Okay. So while the slides are being put up, about um, two to four times a year we give you an update on the eight catalyst projects of the city center plan. Um, and also some of this information may be familiar, but run through it also for those in the community that may be seeing it for the first time. 
So the, the plan was developed with 130 hours of community input and it incorporates and builds upon existing plans that were in place at the time that we um, developed the plan, including the Arts and Entertainment District, the Community Legacy Plan, the Comprehensive Plan, the LDR Plan. So we, uh, we built upon a work in progress in downtown planning. And we um, released the plan in July of 2014, so we're um, approaching our three years of implementation on the 10-year plan. And there are eight catalyst projects, which I think are, could be more defined as catalytic strategic directions. They're broad objectives from which um, uh, we can maintain this broader strategic direction, remembering that it's over a 10-year period for implementation, but to seek your input and the community's input on um, specifically the goals and projects that support the broader strategic directions. And we have a website um, where we um, post our regular updates as well as have documents and maps. And the eight catalytic projects involve five that are new development initiatives and three which are expansion of projects that are currently underway. And then also on the website, one of the documents is a map which is a visual representation of the eight catalytic projects and shows their proximity to the downtown area. And there are two um, projects that are overriding um, all eight catalytic projects. One of those is the Gigabit City. And a partnership with Antietam Cable making a um, $3 million initial investment. 27 cities in the United States um, having Gigabit service and we're the second in Maryland and the first um, in Maryland as a privately funded Gigabit service. This shows the service area rollout in downtown for phase one. Phase two for Antietam Cable started in March and um, by July of this year, 8,000 residents in our community uh, as well as businesses would be served by the uh, high-speed internet service. This is just a graphic that um, shows a speed comparison um, and looking at the last line of fiber showing um, the tremendous capacity compared to other types of internet service and our ability to use this for business attraction. And then there's a, a second company, New Frontier Services. Our agreement with Antietam Cable is a partnership that is not exclusive and so there is another company in the market also offering the service. And the work on the part of um, Main Street Hagerstown and um, DCED and as well as a county team in branding and marketing the Giga, Giga Hub City with a brand identity as well as a uh, gigahubcity.com website which is soon to be released. I'm going to turn it over to Kathy. And then the next one we're going to talk about is what's referred to in the community as the Urban Improvement Project. Sort of started out as the academic hub and then it kind of grew from there and it incorporates a couple of the specific catalyst projects in the Community City Center Plan and then one that was referenced because it was underway when we developed that plan. Basically it's the projects to expand the Maryland Theater, to expand the Board of Education adjacent to the Barbara Ingram School for the Arts, and to expand programming for the University System of Maryland Center at Hagerstown across the street into another building owned by a private developer. And so um, there's a lot of parties that are involved with this in a partnership. They meet every couple of weeks to keep everybody on board and up to speed and keep lines of communication open. And um, there's been a memorandum of agreement developed. It's been signed by um, all the partners that, that lays out what each of us, what our roles are in this project. And um, it's a total of 30 to $37 million project for these the three expansions as well as a uh, proposed connecting pedestrian bridge between the, the locations where the school board children would go and a plaza behind the buildings. The governor has already pledged $7.5 million over five years to go into the project. And the uh, city and the county 
have already contributed or are in the process of contributing $500,000 each for the design work that's underway for the Maryland Theater expansion. City staff have just submitted grants to the Maryland Department of Housing and Community Development, $600,000 from Community Legacy for the Maryland Theater and the Board of Education projects, and $1.5 million to the Maryland Strategic Demolition Fund to help with pre-construction costs for the Maryland Theater project, for the Board of Education project, and for the Plaza project that links them all in the back. Uh, the Maryland Theater Project and the Board of Ed Project, they anticipate going out to bid this fall. These are projects that are well along in the planning process and everyone is working under the assumption these are going to happen. So they're going to be bid in the fall and anticipating construction early in 2018 going through into mid-2019. The USMH Project, which would go into the old Susquehanna building, would be for um, hospitality management on the ground floor and some wet lab, um, STEM kind of labs on the second floor. They have already received bids for that project, and they're working with USM on the budget at this time. We're going to talk a little bit more detail about the Maryland Theater Project and the USMH Project further on because those are actually two identified catalyst projects in the Community City Center Plan. And so we have a couple of renderings. Um, this, is, um, this, this was a rendering for the Maryland Theater that was abandoned long ago. They're now working with this rendering. It shows the demolition of the McBear's Pub and then a construction of a new four-story plus a basement addition across the front, all the way across the front of the, the auditorium. And then um, we don't have the rendering in the package, um, but the building to the right of the Maryland Theater, that's the location for the expansion of the Board of Education, and the intent there is to demolish that building and a brand, build a brand new building, and they will connect. That middle building will connect into the Maryland Theater, and it will connect into the Barbara Ingham School for the Arts. These are some floor plans that you cannot read, but. They, they are good, take our word for it. And this is um, a pretty old sketch showing some of the things. The pink is uh, the University System of Maryland. Blue is a pedestrian bridge to link down to, they're showing highlighted in purple, Barbara Ingram School for the Arts. The building just below that, that's where the new expansion building would go. And then just below that, the Maryland Theater. This is, um, a somewhat dated rendering of what it would look like in the back with the plaza in the front and the modifications to the buildings there for um, 4353, uh, the building that you were just talking about with the developer, and then the building for the university system. Another view of it, again, starting to give you some sense of plaza kind of activity in the back. And the next one. And the first um, catalyst project is office development and recruitment. And this is um, to position downtown to compete for new office development using portions of the central lot, um, building as much as 154,000 square feet uh, over three buildings. The first building would be um, 70,000 square feet. And we issued a request for proposals and we have a um, partnership with Bowman Development, the, um, opportunity would would come once there is an identified tenant or tenants to a minimum of 20,000 square feet so it's important to keep this in play in our downtown plan to be able to respond to an opportunity um, and I think it also helps as class A office space is being built in the region to have a downtown offering I updated the PowerPoint with an um, an additional slide to show Class A office space just from LoopNet that is available in the region, um, the top building being the um, Meridian, the bottom be building being the Trilogy. Um, the middle building is Bowman, um, which I think shows less than 500 square feet available. Um, Bowman is also looking at the adjacent building, the Masonic, as Class A office space. Um, so I think it's a balance between taking existing buildings um, and uh, the renovation of those buildings into Class A, as well as should we have a client that desires new construction to be able to respond. Um, the, the Meridian building is out on Legasburg Pike. The top building is, yes. Yep. Just kind of showing you that Class A office space, there is a demand for it. Um, and it's going somewhere in the region, it's important to be able to offer that to shoppers of Class A space the opportunity to be downtown. 
Um, an additional uh, story, if I can share, is that uh, Jim and Chris the, from Urban Partners were in town and I gave them a tour now, um, three years into the plan of some of our activities. And they said, don't let go of this Class A office space. Don't be discouraged by the fact that something hasn't yet happened, but keep momentum on it um, because you want to be able to respond to opportunities. Back and, to Kathy. Yes. And then Cattle's project number two is the Maryland Theater Expansion Project, which we've already touched on briefly. The goal would be to expand and improve the facility and grow it from 150 to 225 performances per year, increasing the audience by 60,000 annually. That gets us more feet on the street and more success for the theater. Um, they have been uh, busily involved with back of the house facility improvements. They were received um, 175,000 state bond award and that was matched with local hotel tax funding. They completed dressing room remodelings, stage lighting, backstage rigging, artist entry modifications, fire curtain replacement, and fire alarm system. The final phase of the rigging work is scheduled to be um, take place in August. The, um, for the theater expansion, the city and Washington County both committed $500,000, and we've been helping to pay as the bills come through for the architects for the design of the new expansion. And I already touched on the governor's allocation. $5 million of the 7.5 is intended to go towards the theater expansion. And the, the project estimate is about $13.05 million for this project. Um, for theater expansion, they have Grimm and Parker Architects. Um, they've been designing for quite a while now and expect to be completed by the end of the summer. They are coordinating with the school system for the connectivity between the theater and this building because uh, they're the the theater project will be creating up on the, um, is it the third floor a rehearsal stage kind of an area that can be where the students do their practicing and so forth rather than having to use this, the actual performance stage that they want to book for events. And so there's going to be a connection at that point between the school and the theater and then connections down in the basement for, um, for storage because there's going to be room in the school system side to help with the storage needs and the loading needs for the theater. So there's a good uh, partnership that's uh, planned for this connection. And then they've also contracted with a fundraising firm called CCS Fundraising for six months for fundraising services. And their goal is to raise between six and seven million dollars in the private community. And so that is underway. You perhaps have been receiving mail from the Maryland Theater. You might want to stay tuned with that. That's a serious endeavor of theirs to come up with the, all the money that's needed in addition to the government money, the six to seven million from the private sector that they need. A little bit more here, are you done? I'm done. Okay. The um, Catalyst Project number three is expansion of the university system, which is not just expanding class offerings and program offerings, but also capitalizing on um, student housing demand. Um, and the um, on expansion of the programs, um, the university system is creating space in the BB&T building on West Washington for the hospitality management program, and also on the upper floors proposed STEM um, labs. And interior demolition is complete, and they're in the process of um, developing an agreement with the Board of Education for joint use of the space. And then um, our first student housing project is the Patterson, um, which was done in August of 2015 is when we had the first students move in. That's a performing building and um, success in terms of occupancy. We did receive in late 2016 notification that we have 200,000 in community legacy grant for a second student housing project. So we're working on developing the RFP taking lessons learned from the first pilot project and um, bringing that RFP back for your review and approval and then um, using that as a tool to, do, to select a developer partner for the second project. And then this chart just shows the uh, expansion of um, the program offerings and the anticipated housing demand that would come as a result of these um, course offerings both hospitality, the nurse practitioner, and the physician's assistance programs. And recognizing that 50 to 60% of 
Pennsylvania students um, as a, a market for the physician's assistance program would um, potentially relocate for a 27 month program from um, around the region. This shows the BB&T building, the location of the hospitality and STEM labs. And then I included this building at um, 48 South, 43 South Potomac Street. Um, that as a result of the initial student housing project, 12 market rate units were constructed in this building, which are now fully leased. And so this is an example of uh, the private sector coming in and um, looking at the downtown housing demand, um, and mostly occupied by uh, profession professionals um, versus students, uh, those that are working in the region and some that are working downtown. And Catalyst Project Number Four is the Hotel Conference Center Commemorative Park um, proposal in the Community City Center plan. The goal was to construct a 200-room upper upscale hotel, something a little uh, fancier than anything that's in the market. Programmed with adjacent 20,000 square foot conference center, because the filling by Urban Partners was in order to be able to lure an upper upper scale hotel to the downtown, you needed guaranteed room generator in close proximity, so they know that they're going to get business, and so that's why it's recommended for this conference center. And then it established a Civil War Heritage Center and Commemorative Park nearby, again, another room generator um, activity. This has been just in exploratory conversations at this point. It's a much more long-term project in nature. The, uh, the market for this would probably be much more, uh, would be much stronger once the urban improvement project is in place and people can see that we've got demonstrated successful investment projects in addition to the ones that have occurred in recent years. And Catalyst Project Number Five, that's the um, linking City Park and the Washington County Museum of Fine Arts and the A&E District with a trail and new housing. The city has been focused on the trail aspect of that, which was felt that the, the trail would be the amenity that would help lure the housing along the trail. And um, so, let's see. These, these were the renderings before, and now we actually have a trail. But just to give you a little update on where we are, and then we'll get to the photographs, because right now we have a, if you, people have not walked the trail, they should, as a lot of it is in place already. In time for the grand opening on Saturday. Um, phase one construction of this trail began in April of 2016 and was substantially complete by November. The project was completed within budget, which allowed the addition of irrigation into the system. The entrance signs and the wayfinding signs were installed using a grant from the Maryland Heritage Area Authority program. Um, features throughout the trail include 60 or more boulders from the Edgemont Reservoir, pavers and granite insets in the walkway decorative crosswalks and signals to help pedestrians get across, uh, pedestrian lighting, uh, pretty substantial pedestrian lighting throughout the trail, security cameras, trash cans, benches, dog mix stations. The grand opening, as I said, is on Saturday. It starts at noon, goes till 5. The actual ribbon cutting and ceremony will be at 2 in front of the mural of unusual size. This, of course, is the mural of unusual size, which many of us were watching the progress on the Herald Mail Post site where you could see actually see the artist painting, which was pretty interesting. And then actually being installed right now, these are pictures from this morning, so it's not finished yet. On the left are the um, at least two of the planned three artistic, three artistic shade structures and windscreens using grant from the Maryland State Arts Council. And then on the right is um, a large metal sculpture that's in the process of being erected at the, in the oval area on the Herald Mail kind of plaza park area next to the car wash. And that, I've been told by uh, Rodney Tissue that that will be, it'll be anchored in the ground such that children can wander around through it like a little maze kind of a thing. So it's not something that you stand back and go, ooh, you can actually get up and touch it and walk through it. And then all of the faces of Hagerstown have been installed along the fence by the Herald Mail loading area and along the wall by Chick Seafood. And so you should definitely check it out. The names of the photographers are along the bottom. These are photographers from the community that were selected by a jury. We didn't go out looking for professionals. We invited the community to submit faces of Hagerstown for this um, purpose. And so they're on like three by three large, thick, plastic kind of plywoody kind of boards attached to the fence and the wall. It's, it's pretty neat. 
And then on the right picture there, that's a water fountain that's been installed down near the housing authority in the butterfly garden kind of area. And that's another angle of the water fountain with the mural of unusual size in the back. This is the butterfly garden area, and then just installed, the right picture shows another sculpture item, which is looks like flowers and such, but it's metal. And it's right to the right-hand side of that little butterfly garden area. And then there on the left-hand side is where the decorative new decorative fence will go in that screens the Ellsworth yard, and they are actually in the process of construction. There's a, there's a trench with a footer kind of activity, and I actually saw a gentleman working on it today when I took the photo this morning. And then on the right-hand side, it's a little hard to see from this distance, but in yeah, the you way- You took that picture. Yeah, across yeah. the lake, <laughs> across the lake there's a crane, and they were in the process of working on the plaza, which is where the pod sculpture will go, and it's anticipated that will go in, in uh, July. And these are two of the three historic markers that are along the trail. One for um, innovations, you know, manufacturing innovations that occurred in Hagerstown. One about the aircraft industry and one about milling since the um, mural of unusual size is on, painted on one side and partially on two, some of the sides of a very large milling operation that used to be there. And when you, there's a, a limited amount of information on the sign, but then there's also a QR code thing that you can, if you have the app on your phone, you can click into that and then it'll be much more information that you can get to on these topics. And then just more views of the trail. There's wayfinding signs throughout the trail and at every entrance point of, to get onto the trail from a public street, there's a, an entry sign that lets you know, in case people are wandering around, they don't realize the trail's there, that they're at an entry point for the trail. More photos. It's the Housing Authority property on the right there. And then also on the left, two different directions in the similar area of the trail. And this is the crossing point over by the, um, the county permitting building towards the car wash. A couple more entry points onto the trail. Question before we move on to the next catalyst project. The residential aspect project. Um, I know that that's a long-range 10-year kind of plan. Uh, I mean, because I'm unclear of exactly where, but where would we be considering residential uh, along this area? There were two different concepts for that. One was <laughs> creation of rehab buildings along Antietam Street to create like loft type of housing, like say for instance in the, the Antietam Paper Building or renovating the um, the apartment building at the corner of Potomac and Antietam or doing renovations of the Dagmar. So upgrading buildings along that street to create um, more desirable housing. And then the other idea was to fill in some of the parking lot areas as you go south of Antietam down towards Lee Street with new townhouse kind of construction. And so we have not been focusing on the townhouse idea at this point. We certainly encourage folks to do the renovations along Antietam to upgrade the housing, which this trail serves as amenity for that housing. And the Antietam Paper Building, I think, is still being marketed for sale. So hopefully someone will acquire that, intrigued by all that's going on with the Urban Improvement Project and the trail, and we'll see something positive happen there. It's vacant on the upper floors, and I think they still have a, a first floor tenant in the building. Bail Bosman, right? Yeah. Also, there's a subcommittee of the county EDC focused on city center, and they have taken the housing um, on mm -hmm. as a topic area. And so looking at how do we um, package a proposal to a housing developer, I think we need some next steps in terms of um, some homework on that before we go out and approach a um, local housing developer or a, um, a regional one. Um, Part of that is looking at various parcels of land that could be assembled for, um, for new construction of townhomes. Um, likely you have different property owners in that area and land assembly would be um, something that we need to think through how that would happen. The, <coughs> excuse me. the community legacy grant that you just mentioned earlier, the 200,000, would that be something that we could utilize towards those efforts? Um, 
it, it was proposed in our grant uh, application to the state to replicate what we did with the Patterson. So take a, a property and convert it into student housing. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure that we could switch the scope of work that easily, um, but it, it, it's related certainly right. to no, the I rehab. Mean, still, still is student housing, yep. but in a building or development in that area that you were just discussing. Yeah, the, um, because of the connection with the university system, the proximity to the university system is something that's important to them. And we are working with them on what geographic distance would they be comfortable in accepting proposals from property owners that still meet their, their thoughts. And then we will, when we have Pretty sure Antietam Street isn't any further away from oh, the university exactly. than Franklin Street is. The trail. Up through the trail. And well, so we will, and we won't just rely on advertising the RFP. We'll make sure it gets into the hands of property owners downtown that have buildings that seem like they would be suitable for this kind of activity. Right. Not to beleaguer this, although I'm going to. New construction of of in, in putting together pieces of property. I mean, what? Because I'm at a loss. I, I don't know what properties between Antietam and Lee Street would be available in any way shape or form at this point in time or anywhere in the, in the 10 year period probably uh, to create new residential townhomes or, or whatever yeah their concept was right now the land that they had the urban partners had looked at is is fully utilized by the property owners for parking and so their thinking was if instead of service parking, it was filled in with housing, then you start to pull together linking the neighborhood on South Prospect Street and the residential neighborhood on South Potomac Street, did it all together by having the trail and housing in the middle. Right now it's, it's very open because there used to be rail lines that went through there. And then when the rail lines went away, they became parking lots in many cases. And so that's, that was the thinking of that. We as staff had anticipated that that would be a tricky nut to crack. Expensive, Patrick. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. I was just trying to get some clarification. <laughs> Project number six is expanded downtown arts and events programming. Um, we estimate, I think this is a low estimate, that there's over 119 individual events that happen in downtown and over 1,000 attendees to various events it's on the smaller scale. The wind down Fridays um, have six events from May to October. Uh, continuing partnership between the Maryland Theater and the city. And the second Saturday program benefited from a $10,000 grant from the state and um, had just a recent um, second Saturday event um, this past Saturday with their Saturday sweep up event, um, which was a beautification effort by more than 30 volunteers downtown. And then uh, some events like the summer slide, the St. Patrick's Day run, and then we've been in front of you recently with um, uh, the role of uh, our department in helping to develop event guidelines that uh, make it easier for event organizers to understand and navigate um, the moving parts of putting an event together using downtown as a venue. Question. Uh, and and I've, I've said this a couple times in, in other arenas, but. I would truly love to see us be able to utilize the trail in, in, in particular uh, when it comes to um, the Blues Fest and all this Toberfest uh, with the county parking lot and the Harold Mail parking lot, big open area down there that could be um, uh, utilized as opposed to central lot. Uh, I mean, I any, I mean, I, I just believe that we could really pull people to that area and set vendors up along the trail and, and I agree I think just like University Plaza it's a it will become a new public space and a gathering place for people in our community and it's a, a natural place for event programming mm -hmm. um, and it lessens the logistics demands of street closures um, and it, it, with events creating foot traffic and a tie to the business community, uh, it's naturally adjacent to the Main Street area that uh, you can still have the impact for the businesses. Yep. Something to look at. Uh, yep. Okay. 
Um, Main Street Hagerstown is a key part of expanding arts and event programming. Main Street is organized with five work groups. Um, lots of activity um, in the organization work group. I'll just highlight a couple of their activities. They recently held a volunteer appreciation and recruitment event. The design committee is working on window scrims and um, helping with vacant storefront buildings as well as looking at design guidelines for all sorts of things like signs, sidewalks, displays, and paint schemes. The Clean, Safe, and Green team um, is looking at um, the installation of the benches and the LED lighting, which we've been in, uh, before you on that topic recently, as well as a, an announcement in May of a 5,000 Keep Maryland Beautiful grant award. So the Main Street group will be administering um, $5,000 for beautification type efforts. And then the promotions work group has been working on the second Saturday series as well as other marketing efforts and social media. Um, business relations work group is continuing their focus group feedback sessions, now looking at some consumer feedback as well as um, serving as ambassadors for welcoming new businesses. They're helping with the branding of the one gigabit services um, and they are also assisting with implementing two state main street grant grants for um, pop-up to permanent which was eight thousand dollars and an architectural services and code analysis grant for seven thousand uh, dollars we also have a grant um, to administer facade improvements at twenty five thousand from the state community legacy and then um, also the engine room art space continues to deliver uh, art exhibits regularly as another program of the city. The farmer's market, I think one of our key successes uh, since we last reported out is the recruitment of the Valley Co-op to the farmer's market, really providing us with an anchor tenant uh, in the building and um, providing access to over 35 local suppliers for fresh produce and uh, goods. And then um, also continuing collaborative meetings with the county mm -hmm. and how we can con continue to grow the market. Um, there is also the idea of reissuing the RFP for um, private operation of the market. Um, we have yet to come back to you with a, a revised RFP, but that's something still on our work plan. And then finally, Catalyst Project Number Eight: the expanded and targeted home ownership support. Um, the goals are to market home ownership incentives and support neighborhoods first programs, establish annual license, rental licensing inspections, which occurred, and continue excessive nuisance enforcement programs. Under rental licensing, the um, annual exterior inspections provide additional support to the neighborhoods. Occurs, um, 9,102 units are registered and 3,000. 468 properties in the city. Vacant structures program, 554 vacant properties are in the program. Inspections of licensed structures are ongoing to ensure protection of our neighborhoods and first responders from exterior, blight, and unsafe interior conditions. And then the home ownership program, switch over. This involved three properties. We had a $150,000 community legacy award in FY16 to assist with acquisition rehab for home ownership. Um, 278 South Prospect Street we got from the state and was sold and now owner occupied. 261 South Prospect Street was a four unit apartment building on South Prospect that we acquired with the plan to convert it into two condos for home ownership. Um, so far rear porches have been demolished, the roof replacement is underway and the architectural work is complete. And then 64 East Franklin Street, that was a, a townhouse on East Franklin Street next to Anagata Delights that we acquired and renovated and it's a beautiful three floor uh, Second Empire housing unit that's available for sale and we continue assessments for other opportunities in the, in the targeted neighborhoods. There's a map later that shows the targeted neighborhoods for this type of activity that's um, recommended in the Community City Center Plan. But first here's um, 
the 278 South Prospect, which was sold to an owner occupant, and 261 South Prospect, the four unit building that's going to be renovated to create two condos for home ownership. And then Is that this. a single family unit now? It's four apartments. Four. Oh, okay. Four. Yeah. And they will not be condos, they'll actually be two separate. Oh, okay. So it'll be a duplex. Yes. All right. And then 64 East Franklin Street, you have a before picture on the left and um, an after picture on the right. This is some of the interior work. It used to be on the left-hand side is before. You came in the front door to a very narrow little hallway with the stairs on the left. The, uh, that, that hallway wall was removed, so now it opens up when you come in the front door. It's a very open space. This is the living room area in the front, and then you see through into the opened-up area. That's the kitchen, the renovated kitchen. And then, I don't know if we have some upstairs. Yes, there's some upstairs pictures. So there's, there's bedrooms and a full bath on the second floor and then a master suite and a full bath on the third floor. It's, it's a really nice unit. I was in here a couple of times for photo ops. We well, spent enough money on it, it ought to be nice. Yeah. yeah, you spend enough, you can get a really nice product. This is, we've got it listed now on Zillow, it's for sale. It's also um, posted on the city website as being available. And uh, the Department of Community Economic Development are exploring other opportunities to do this type of online um, pr uh, announcement of offering like Zillow. And the renovations were funded with um, community development block grant. So this is the, the federal program that's designed for this type of home ownership development. And it has to meet certain criteria to be sold to anyone. Income qualification for the buyer. Be a great house for a family. It's got a lot of space. And then city center, city center residency initiative Seven homes were purchased with down payment assistance and 18 residents renting with rental payment assistance since December of 2013. Uh, the program funding was expended. We were awarded 50,000 in community legacy funds to be matched with uh, 50,000 in city funds to replenish the down payment portion of this program. And so we will have $100,000 available this fall to get this program going again because it was very popular. And those are the four targeted neighborhoods where Urban Partners found that the sales were comparatively uh, for home ownership were healthy. The home ownership levels were higher than in some areas. Certainly, um, I don't know about that top neighborhood, but certainly in some of the areas there was there was like a, a foothold of home ownership that was that the recommendation was to support that to protect the investment of those folks and to draw in more folks for home ownership in these neighborhoods. And. And I would add just a closing comment that uh, throughout the presentation we talked a lot about each of the different grant programs that are supporting the initiatives. So we recognize when city resources are limited that we have tapped in um, uh, quite frequently to a range of grant programs to help us accomplish the goals. Quick question and not, to, and, and, uh, not including the, the residential in East Franklin. How many Home ownership program homes does the city of Hagerstown now have in its inventory? How many properties do we own? That are under the home ownership, supposedly under the guise of the home ownership program. I'm going to turn to my colleague. We have two duplexes on Donovan Street for a total of four units there. Uh, one property at 64 East Franklin, and then one more property at 261 South Prospect Street, which will be a duplex. So a total of six? Six properties. Have we thought? about doing what we did several years ago, uh, partnering with Habitat to maybe move some of those off our inventory? We, we've definitely Habitat discussed cost, yeah. those items with Habitat. Actually, uh, we've made a few repairs to the one duplex on Jonathan Street. We have an interested home buyer uh, looking to possibly buy both units in the 400 block. Um, and 261 uh, renovations will hopefully be underway in the coming months once the architectural documents they're finalized, but we still have to now go through the bid process for that one. The ones in the 200 block. That, that is the more difficult property to move. And we continue to explore partnerships with Habitat. We've even reached out to CAC and we continue to try to find a solution for that one as well. Thanks, Jonathan. Thanks, Jonathan. When we talk about solutions, you're talking about home ownership solutions, is that correct? That's the goal. Okay. Um, but we're open to, uh, once again, partnership opportunities with Habitat. Community Action Council or other entities. Well, with Habitat, it is home ownership. Correct. That CAC. is right, but CAC right. gets me starts getting. Yeah, that's not right. Well, I mean, I don't know about the structure, but. Yeah. Tear it down and do that. Exactly. 
on staff. So, of, I mean, this, because this isn't my first, obviously, review of this, and you guys give us an update. Um, but this is really the first mm -hmm. broader update to, to this new body. And so, um, one of my questions that I, that I raised, you know, uh, previously, uh, when we started talking about goal setting, was you know here are you know here's the eight things that we sort of identified, um, and any one of them can sort of happen you know uh, um, independent of the others, and and the, the reality is at the end of the day, uh, the other benefit is if any one of them doesn't happen, it doesn't you know it doesn't hurt. Uh, the, the chances of success for, for any of the other items. Sure. I think that that's one of the good parts about this whole process. But one of the things we haven't done as a new body is determine that, you know, that these are the parameters of the eight items that have been laid out before us. Um, and uh, in that vein, you know, when you give the presentation, two questions pop into my mind. And the first question is, you know, I don't want to. I don't want to be like some of the things, and, and the, the closest thing that comes to my mind is when uh, we go down state for those, those those items as a coalition each year, and we sort of kept some of those items around even though they're done. And so I don't want to get in this process where we just simply keep it on here. You know what I mean? And we reach that success. So I think at some point we got to we've got to to, to uh, acknowledge that you know we we've, we've attained that goal and that success has been achieved and it gets moved off otherwise it just sort of stays on there you know because I mean, we want to keep reminding folks that, that you know that we did something ses successful and made it important I'd rather say we've accomplished that you know and, and, and we've checked that box and, and um, it's run its course and the other is I don't want the any of these items especially uh, as bodies change I don't want any items frankly in my opinion to remain on here that are going to languish in um, um, uh, an absence of, of uh, movement because there is a lack of interest. And I don't think that's a question that we've sort of asked ourselves of this body. Um, and, and I'll just, <laughs> I'll just, you know, for, for the sake of, of an example, you know, being unpopular in the, uh, you know, in the moment, I'll just throw out uh, one of mine, and I've questioned it, I think, from, from the beginning, uh, at least in the context that it was created which uh, was this Hotel Conference Center and Heritage Center commemorative park. And I think part of that centered around, you know, obtaining that property from, from the hospital and, and having a park there. And, and I guess I just have never sort of bought into uh, that idea. Uh, and then here's where I enter that sort of personal plug that, that, that I often do. But I do buy into uh, the fact that um, uh, other uh, venues have achieved that success on a hotel conference center basis uh, for uh, uh, youth athletic uh, oriented um, sports activities um, which gets to my you know continued uh, push for for an indoor turf facility and, and and I still think there's no better place than the East End to do that I still think that, that the hospital site the Venice and those areas make up the best opportunity uh, for that to happen and provide the best link to the fairgrounds and, and other areas that, that, that already, you know, uh, um, have those amenities and, and have that draw. And I guess for me, I look at project number four, you know, and, and, and just as one council member, I'd like to steer in that direction uh, uh, with that project. Um, you know, I'm not sold on, on the, 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 this, you know, this idea of attaching, uh, you know, a Civil War Heritage Museum. Uh, to it as as uh, as much as I believe that that you know uh, uh, youth sports and athletics and those, those types of recreational uh, amenities uh, create a more competitive draw um, uh, any more than, than than project one where this office development and recruitment I mean I think it's a great idea uh, you know we've identified places for it we've identified obviously you know, like a specific place for it but um, you know, I don't want that to sit there and then, you know, two years from now, it's exactly where it's at. I want to make sure that there's the flexibility 
available that, that you know, if, if some comparable and similar idea emerges, that that item has that flexibility to, to, to move in that direction. And that's, that's just my, my two cents on these. And I'm not really sure where to bring that up and, and, and interject that into the conversation because I feel like this is sort of an update when what I really want to have is a conversation among the body about you know these uh, these items. I, I mean, as a staff, we would greatly welcome that direction because we're just going to continue to do this because this is the direction that we're mm -hmm. working under. So that that would be fabulous. Yeah, like for me, you know, you look at item six where it says expand downtown. I mean, at some point, you know what I mean. I'd like to know two things uh, from that particular Catalyst Project Six. What's the level we're trying to reach? So that we can say we've attained that level, you know. You say 116 or 119 events. You know, what's the number we're trying to reach, and and um, what do you need from us to do that? And I guess that's sort of how I look at each of these. Is you know, where are we trying to get to, and what do you need from us to get there? Mm -hmm. And that, that that that's how I sort of you know try and think in my mind each time you you make these presentations, um, and. You know, I think number eight is, is a good example. And I think Paul, you just asked the question. You know, if the home ownership is, is, is what we're trying to get geared toward, and we hear that the 50,000 and the additional 50 have been released in the fall, you know what I mean? What other mechanisms do you need from us to get to where we're trying to get with, with, with that particular uh, goal? And I think we can take topics like you just mentioned and come back to you in, with, in an individual work session where we focus on a single topic. That's what I would like. Yeah. That's, that's, right. I think this gets back to is us establishing our goals. We've talked about that for six months now and haven't really done it. I know we had talked about maybe a retreat or something to figure out what the goals of this body are going to be. No, and I agree. I think that's uh -huh. what you're kind of. Because we've, like you said, we've had that discussion. And, and I, quite honestly, we've only had the discussion a couple of times and it hadn't really came up that being that there was three members of the body that were in the previous body that that was just what it was. And I appreciate. Councilman Offshore bringing that up because I think we all have concerns and questions with, with some of them in the direction that things need to be going. So, um, you know, the, the number one, as he said, with the office development, I think you said it very well. If not, we want to be in a position that we don't let it go, but at the same time, we have $250,000 sitting there, correct, for that project. Mm -hmm. But if it's just sitting there and nothing's happening, would we be better off utilizing that money for another project? And still be able to, you know, leverage that project when it comes up. I mean, those would be all things that would be discussions mm -hmm. towards those specific projects. And again, as you mentioned, the, the hotel and conference center, what direction that may or may not go. And I guess the long and short it would be, yeah, if we could get individual conversations for I, each potential I, I project would, or work sessions. I would I think. love to have that. I mean, right. I think that we need to. We'll set a date, City Administrator, for a. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's what I've been trying to get for. Okay. Sure, Don. Thank you. First, I want to say to you, uh, thank you for the update. It was, uh, Kristen and I have had a lot of these updates since Urban Partners presented this, their plan. And it gets better every time. You all have uh, added essentially added two new projects, Gigabyte and you or whatever that <laughs> is, uh, which belong on this plan and uh, are an intimate, uh, will be an intimate part of this plan coming to fruition. I do want to be careful, though, that we don't throw anything away before we're satisfied, totally satisfied, that it's not going to work out. I agree that if something isn't going to work out, it doesn't belong on the plan. But I think we need to give it a time. It is a 10-year plan. And it's also no accident that this plan is moving along. Uh, that doesn't happen by accident. It happens by design. And I'd like to uh, just say thanks to you all and all those people who are making this stuff happen. Thank Anybody you else? Council as well for giving us permission to work on things and approving mm -hmm. the grants that we've chased. Right. 
I had a couple other things written down, but I think I'll reserve those till we have the individual conversation. I did have one question, though, a reference to pod. The tree that got cut down, was that going to be cut down regardless, or was that cut down just to make uh, room for pod? That big uh, the weeping willow. The willow tree. Yeah. Yeah, I've gotten we some feedback get, from various people about the tree is gone. <laughs> I, I so I know it was reported that it was diseased, it but I don't know if it was on, I was just curious if it was already on <laughs> schedule or regardless right. one way or another that tree was coming down or not. Um, but we'll find that inquiring minds have inquired. <laughs> Anybody else? Well, that's it. Oh, yeah, I'll make this one point. Yeah, got it. Paul just reminded me. That shot that you presented showing the water or looking at the pod, I'll tell you this, the water looks a whole lot better than it ever did in past shots. <laughs> Anybody else? <laughs> Thank you guys very much. Thank you. Thank you. Steve, your turn. FEMA and MDE uh, uh, required updates in the flood plan, flood plain management ordinance. Can you be like kind of quick? Sure. I've been, I've been in the planning and zoning field for 27 years, and this is by far the driest, most boring package of text amendments I've ever prepared. Uh, the FEMA has been in the process of updating the city's floodplain management, uh, excuse me, floodplain maps. They go into effect on August 15th. They have directed us to make certain amendments to our uh, floodplain ordinance amendment, uh, ordinance, excuse me, floodplain management ordinance. Uh, to implement those, including the adoption date or the effective date, excuse me, of those maps going into effect, and also a package of the vast majority of which are excruciatingly minor wordsmithing kind of adjustments to the package. I'm going to spare you and not go through them one by one. If you have any questions about any particular one, I'll be happy to try to answer them for you. I'm good on all of them. Okay. I'm with the mayor. There, there is one where it was presented to the city as an option, and the planning commission recommended we not adopt it and maintain uh, flexibility. Um, staff uh, endorses that and recommends also that that one, propo one potential proposal uh, be omitted from the uh, version that we will uh, present to you next week. It will be uh, up for uh, introduction next week. Yeah. And then we'll have a special meeting uh, early July, uh, just prior to the beginning of your normal workshop uh, meeting, uh, to uh, to officially adopt it. And then it would go into effect the very date that the uh, that the maps take effect uh, through FEMA. Fantastic. How's you that for short? Support. You were superb. Without a doubt. Thanks, Steve. Mm -hmm. Chief. Uh, the chief uh, is going to give us a uh, an operational update. How you doing, chief? I'm doing well. Good afternoon, everybody. I want to pass out some information for you. I want to give you. I want to take you to. Take you to school for a little bit. Um, Want to educate you on what is and what is not synthetic cannabinoids. If we can pass that out, please. Also, I'm going to pass out these down if I can. This is something I previously handed out to you. I sent these to you electronically last Friday. I want you to have that, and that's the Good Samaritan Law regarding. possession um, and things that we have at our disposal in an enforcement action and what we don't have at our disposal. Right. Let me just start out with, I think it's important for us to, and you as a body to understand what some of the things we're grappling with in our city, not only our city, but regionally, statewide, and in most major cities that we have in the region. Synthetic cannabinoids, aka spice, K2, etc. Um, you see the, the nice packaging that it has, and that's what it usually comes out to. Um, but let me just move on. I think I have my little clicker here. Synthetic cannabinoids, they're initially 
very unregulated. Sold as potpourri and et cetera, things that sold primarily in convenience stores, 7-Elevens, those type of things, mom and pop shops that they have in regionally. There's virtually hundreds of compounds, chemical compounds regarding synthetic cannabinoids. It gained attention and regulatory attention um, when public safety issues rose um, when law enforcement came in to the purview of these type of chem uh, chemicals and, and uh, substances. You'll look at some of the packaging, and if you see that it will, almost all the packaging that we come across and they have since the inception, it'll say not for human consumption. That's usually just kind of skirt FDA regulation and the, such. You know, so it looks like potpourri, it's not for human consumption, but that's not exactly how it's used. Most of it, if not all, is produced in China. Comes over here through the dark web and other means. What's interesting is usually it's in a crystallized substance, and how it usually is uh, put into the plant-like material is that it's dissolved in solvent, usually in fingernail polish um, remover, an acetone. Usually it's made into a liquid, put into a plant sprayer, um, and then the plant, uh, the actual plant material is laid out on a tarp and it's sprayed. What's interesting about it is that there's no uniformity. It could be a heavy batch, it could be a light batch, it could be very little of the chemical getting on that plant material. Um, every, it depends on the user and who's putting it down. Usually it comes over here in this country. It's put in packaging and it's sold here um, and how it's put out throughout our region. But it's, uh, there's no rhyme or reason about, there's no regulatory control, there's no anything. It's usually done in some garage or some uh, surreptitious place, and it's usually done very quickly. Could be heavy dough, could be heavy uh, um, outlay of the chemical on the plant material or light layer. Um, even in a batch of it, it could be different in every package. Could, could I ask you one question? Sure. Is it imported legally or is it imported illegally? Well, the chemical that comes over here, depending on what the chemical is, usually sometimes it comes in the dark web. What happens is that the chemical itself, some of the chemicals are not on a schedule, schedule one, like marijuana, cocaine, and heroin. Right. Sometimes it comes over here, it could come over here legally. It's the testing process, and I'll get to that in a little bit. So a lot of the process, the thing about spice is that it's highly unregulated. It's incredibly hard. You can't field test. There's not a field test for it. We can field test for marijuana, cocaine, and heroin and those type of things. You cannot field test. There's not a field test available because the chemical composition of spice changes as soon as usually the maker gets on to that, the DEA is going to put it on the schedule one, you know, chemical. Very, very difficult. Thank um, you. The packaging, again, it looks like candy, you know, and it goes to, it draws people's eyes. It's done very, very well in a marketing campaign, you know, um, how they put this stuff out. There's absolutely no quality control whatsoever. It doesn't come from a factory. It usually comes from some sort of uh, someone's basement, garage, or some surreptitious place, like I said before. Traditional cannabinoids, THC, marijuana, is derived from the plant. It's a depressant, a hallucinogen, and it's in high concentrations. And that changes with the actual plant itself. Synthetic cannabinoids have a different molecule structure and are different from marijuana plants. Um, but they're functionally similar to the active ingredients in marijuana plants, but they're extremely much more potent. The origins date back the research to a bunch of pharmaceutical companies over 50 years ago in the United States um, for treatment and overseas also and for treatment of cancer patients and more recently AIDS victims. So it's nothing new in the chemical composition. It goes back a long time. We were first seen in Germany, Switzerland, Great Britain in 2004. Poison control centers in the United States started issuing warnings around 2010. The first cases identified in Hagerstown, Western Maryland by the Western Maryland Crime Laboratory in 2011. Um, just to give you an idea, the Hagerstown Police Department has the Western Maryland Crime Laboratory. There's many crime laboratories, most of them run by the state and throughout the, uh, not that many throughout the state, but we have our own. Um, probably the best of all of them throughout the state. They're unbelievably effective um, 
Jeff Kirchival, who's the director of our crime lab laboratory, is an unbelievable director. Um, it was Jeff and his team which were able to find the substance when we tested it and made it um, uh, find the Schedule One substance. We were able to make multiple arrests on distribution of this substance. This is kind of what it looks like. Could look like potpourri. Sometimes it looks like granola. It could look like anything. It could be sprayed on any plant substance whatsoever. In 2008, the chemical ingredients of spice, spice were identified in Europe. Chemical one compound is identified as a public safety problem regulated by DEA. DEA regulates the Schedule One drugs. It has to come through the DEA for it to be a Schedule One drug in order for us to order to prosecute. Maryland law, which I'll get into, um, comports to the federal law. Again, we, we saw it initially where it was sold readily, convenience stores, gas station, head shops, through the internet, um, through the dark web. There's no age restrictions on it whatsoever because it was sold not for human consumption. Um, the distribution now, um, traditional underground sales, um, have pushed it underground to a lot due to our law enforcement actions. The side effects are many. And as you can see here, I don't, I'm not going to go through all of them. You, you have a copy of the PowerPoint. Um, it's virtually, they cover every spectrum um, of anything that would happen when you take an illegal substance uh, and a substance that could harm you, whether it be cocaine, heroin, um, methamphetamines, um, and spice. The problematic issue for us is that almost always, if it's, derm, if it's deemed by the general public, if it's not illegal, it must be safe. So people will ingest it. You know, unfortunately, there are some that have addiction that would smoke a dandelion should it be told to them that it would make them high. That's just a fact. Um, not detected in, in routine drug screenings. Um, if you were to send someone for an employee drug screen, um, it's not going to be detected. Um, or by a probation officer. Or parole nope. Officer. It's not. It's, it's, um, it's incredibly hard to detect. Um, again, um, it's very easy to tame. There's lack of uniformity in ma ma uh, manufacturing. Every batch changes with unknown ingredients, unknown concentrations, uh, the pharmaceutical effects. And again, it's often much stronger than THC. In Maryland Criminal Code, and I mentioned just a moment ago, the Maryland Criminal Code Section 5202 comports to the federal code. So what Maryland would deem uh, a Schedule One drug, the federal government, same thing. It's, it comports to each other. The law enforcement problems associated with synthetic cannabinoids uh, are huge. Um, you have to identify the active ingredient. In order for us, if we were to stop someone, and we'd have probable cause to search some reasonable suspicion. And the only time we do are able to search people is under Terry versus Ohio when it comes to um, a pat down search for weapons only. We don't pat down people for narcotics. Don't do it. It's unconstitutional. Okay. We pat down people for weapons, for their safe, for our safety and the public safety. Period. We don't pat down people just to pat them down for drugs. Can't do it. You go to jail for it and wind up federal court in Baltimore. Um, identifying the active ingredients is very hard. Uh, the purchasing reference standards for comparison to evidence for our laboratory are expensive. It costs a couple hundred dollars. Usually to look at. Do drug dogs hit on it? No. That's the hardest part. Drug right. dogs don't pick. Our dogs will pick up on a lot of substances. Now, if it's laced with marijuana, THC, yeah, it'll pick up on it. Um, if it's, uh, it could pick up on it, but it's, it's difficult. You know, um, it's depending on the substance, but it'd have to be a substance that we already, are, that the dog's already trained on, whether it be methamphetamine, heroin, cocaine, et cetera. Um, the amount of time required to perform analysis, if we didn't have the Western Maryland Crime Lab in the city, it'd be weeks. It'd be weeks. We'd have to send it out to the state. We have a quick turnaround. We had a quick turnaround with our crime lab. Um, we are blessed to have them. What is, what is that turnaround time? Usually a couple days. couple days. Yeah, usually a couple days. So if I were to find 
uh, in a in a in a situation where it would give us cause to uh, be able to recover evidence from an individual um, outside of a medical emergency where they're not getting treated by CRS or any uh, ambulance or they're not requesting um, uh, association uh, help association with a drug overdose um, through a medical emergency if we were to come across it for a mere possession case we'd have to test it couldn't make a summary arrest on that individual that's what the difficulty is can't make a summary arrest um, what we would have to do is uh, send it out for testing then apply for a warrant for their possession uh, and the arrest for a possession case I can tell you my experience the appetite for prosecution for a possession case is this big you know not only in this county and anywhere possession is very difficult the mere possession case most likely if we made a possession case and we can prove it um, they'll be in and out very quickly and we'll probably spend about eight hours processing that individual taking an officer off the street for a possession case um, that's just the facts of it very very difficult um, there's current no effective field test um, on the market none um, the law is consistently trying to catch up to new compounds because what will happen is that once dealers and people that bring poison such as this into our community, once they determine that we've figured out what that Schedule One drug is, they'll change the compound molecules to another compound. Um, and then we have to wait till that gets scheduled as a scheduled drug through the DEA and through um, their process. It sounds like that process could be timely. Could be extremely timely. And it depends on those. Now, mind you, now the DA is very good, um, but again, that they're playing catch up too. So we're usually a step behind in the process. Usually, once we determine it, we fortunately, the, some of the compounds that we found here in the city recently, um, we were able to identify those individuals and who brought that in, and we were able to make those summary arrests. But I'll get to some of the data about what we've done here in the city. Um, new compounds enter the market unrelated, um, unregulated, therefore preventing prosecution. If it's not on a scheduled drug and it's not Schedule 1, we can't make an arrest until it is a Schedule 1. So therefore, it's just poison. Just like someone would, um, some communities you've seen where people will, will inhale PAM or paint or do those things to get high. Um, addiction is a systemic problem throughout our community. It's very, very difficult. Um, that's basically that's basically it for synthetic cannabinoids but let me just give you kind of some data year to date in the city of Hagerstown we've had 112 spice overdoses um, I'm not going to say reactions because um, clinically it's an overdose when medical attention comes and someone is not you know two now that number is probably exacerbated because there's probably many people that have gone out to other facilities or have experienced a reaction and overdose that haven't reported to the police or fire, et cetera. That number's probably exponentially larger um, than 112, but the cases that we've been involved on are 112. Of those 112, 81 were by 23 individuals. Okay, 81 were by 23 people. So if you do the math, same individuals, multiple times overdosing on it. It's a very, very difficult process. Last year at this time, the heroin overdoses were very similar in number year to date in 2016 through date today. The numbers were extremely same. Uh, I think the heroin overdoses were about 110 um, non-fatals, and they are about 112 for spice overdoses. The heroines were different. Now, heroin overdoses have been down um, in the city over 40%, roughly, from year to date. Now let me, uh, fatal overdoses have been down about 50, uh, 50%. That does not mean the problem is going away, by no means. You know, there's a lot of people now in, in the community and, and what we have intel on is that some people will have um, Narcan that they have themselves, you know. And they'll revive, they'll have people that they have and they bought Narcan and they'll have people that will revive themselves and they have an overdose. We may not be involved in it. Sometimes they don't get us involved in it. Um, so it's a significant issue for us. But what we always try to do is we always try to track back and use investigative means to find the people that bring it in because that's where the fruit is for us and that's where our money is. Um, the prosecution on people with possession is 
extremely difficult. As you've seen in what I sent you out, uh, sent to you regarding the uh, Good Samaritan Act in Maryland, um, and it has to do with victims and people that call, but if they have paraphernalia, if they have product on them, they have contraband, we can't make an arrest for those misdemeanor cases. It doesn't mean that if there's not a felony involved, we can make an arrest with a felony. It doesn't mean we can't investigate, because we absolutely do investigate. We always try to track back from the individual. If we get cooperation, to find out where the source is. Now, we've made multiple arrests for distribution of spice in the city. We've also locked up uh, many people that were not on a medical emergency with spice-related crimes that we've been able to lock people up with, uh, whether it be no trespassing in certain areas of the city. We've used that ordinance. Um, uh, we've done a lot of different areas on that particular, on those particular issue. It's very, very difficult. Um, it's frustrating as a law enforcement professional. I've been involved in uh, many, many, many narcotics cases. Um, in Washington, crack cocaine in the late 80s and early 90s was, um, gave rise to the most violent area in the city. You know, uh, in, in Washington, you know, we had, more, uh, we had more homicides per capita than anywhere else in the country because of crack cocaine. Heroin spice is much greater, particularly heroin. Heroin affects just virtually everywhere. Whether you have something, you have nothing. Um, it's a systemic problem for us because we can never, uh, and I can tell you back in the late 80s and early 90s, we locked over for 60,000 people. It did not reduce our homicides and the violence in the community. It did not reduce or stop the problem. It wasn't until we involved our community and all other all other providers that we had a push down in the re, in the in the in the reduction of violence, the collaboration that we had. It, it's it's a problem that truly is much more significant than the police department, and those are issues that we grapple with today. And as uh, most of you know here, that we try to work with everybody, you know. Um, but the you know we. When I mentioned this, uh, the heroin reductions that we have, please don't don't take that as that you know we're we're solving the problem. You know, there's because we're not, you know, not. That's just a reduction that we've seen because you know there's um, a lot of it's going underground. A lot of people don't report it, and again, a lot of people are using their own Narcan to revive themselves. Um, it's a significant issue that we're going to grapple with. We have utilized a great deal of resources. The response that we have to do, and most of, and mind you, most of these. Spice overdoses in the city. Most of them, uh, somebody will call in that someone's passed out, someone's acting funny. The police department, CRS, and the fire department usually sometimes respond. Sometimes all three, sometimes not. When we respond to that, usually what will happen almost 80% of the time is that they refuse treatment. They walk away. You know, they don't want to be treated. They don't want to be um, involved um, at all. Um, they're most likely, and, and in most cases, they're incredibly uncooperative with us. Matter of fact, we just, uh, we were able to make a, and just to kind of give you a, a, a snapshot of the mindset that we've had to deal with, we made a distribution arrest on Spice um, in the city about 10 days ago, uh, a little bit less than 10 days ago, almost about a week ago. When we made that distribution arrest, we had about, oh, roughly about 80 packets of spice that we were able to seize. There was an individual that was coming in to purchase some of that product. And that individual was extremely mad at us because we stopped him from getting his high for the day. Okay. That's, that's, that's the addiction. The addiction, spice is extremely addictive as, in, as everybody knows heroin is. Um, yes. So I think when, you know, I think for me, and I think, first let me say, I think that the public thinks that, 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 that we get some massive amount of information above and beyond what the average citizen gets, and, and we don't. Mm -hmm. I mean, we, and I think, you know, at least we've communicated via email some conversation that, you know, your operations are your operations, and, and you know, for me, this is more of, of an educational opportunity in, in general terms, you know, and not of specifics because those are policing matters. This body shouldn't be engaged directly in, in you know, directing that process. 
Um, uh, that, that's what we are here for. I would agree. Um, so I guess for me, though, I think that people that I've talked to in the community view this similar to when I talk to folks, you know, on uh, uh, the city boundary mm -hmm. or housing is that, you know, if, if you've got an Hagerstown address, then you must live in Hagerstown. If you are in Section 8, then, then you're, you know, it's all public housing. In other words, everybody, I think folks look at this the same way they do some of these other items where they lump it all under one single, you know, uh, um, umbrella. Sure. And I guess for me, and, and part of the concern that I raised uh, in, in, the, in the communications was just like this evening, I hear you talking about, you know, arrests that you made at Spice and, and, and users and, and, you know, the, the dynamics associated with it. You know, and then somebody actually sent me today that that's, has a class at HCC and they gave these questions to answer, you know, and they're intermingling opioids and heroin and crisis and things like that, you know, all in the same sort of single uh, framework. And my curiosity is, you know, we've obviously had some, 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 some uh, public articles and, and arrests uh, and, and criminal activity associated with, with local gang activity. Mm -hmm. We've had, uh, you know, the, the, the spice activity and we have the heroin overdose. And, and I think everybody just sort of wants to lump them under a single roof and say, hey, city, all of these are the same thing. Why aren't you addressing this one thing? And, and for me, I, I think when you say, you know, you, you want to educate us, I think that the public needs to understand that, that they may be very dynamically different and on completely separate paths uh, 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 from one another. You are exactly right. They are three separate issues. Um, they have some overlap in some of the things, but let me talk to you about, you know, um, the questions that I get. I have people stop me all the time and says, you know, why don't you just leave them alone? Let them just, you know, lay on the sidewalk. Why don't you just let them, you know, overdose? Why don't you do those things? If we ever get to that point, and I'll cover you a couple of your points, if we ever get to that point as a police department, as a society, we're in big trouble. You know, the number one priority for us has always been life safety and solving crimes. They're simultaneous. You know, they're together. They work together. So, you know, just like we have a, we get a call for a suicide. And some would say that, you know, the, these are people that have significant challenges in their life. But as a society and as a police department, you know, if we get a call for uh, a suicide, a person jumping off a building or a bridge, et cetera, you know, we're just going to drive by and say, okay, well, you know, if they jump, go ahead and jump. You know, we're not going to do that. You know, we're going to try to help that person. The same thing with an overdose. Even though they may be overdosing, as I said, 81 times 23 people with those 81 overdoses. That's significant, but we can never give up. You know, we can never give up on a human body, on a human life. Um, it's, it's difficult. It's difficult for us, but and it, the challenge for me and the challenge for my agency is not to be jaded, you know, with individuals that are experiencing these things. Um, it's frustrating, but we can never get there. But the three instances you're talking about, Heroin, spice, some of the gang violence, we've, uh, they're separate. Uh, they're separate issues. Um, there may be some uh, overlap in some very minor things regarding narcotics and possession, and you've probably seen and read some of those things, so I'm not telling you anything out of school. Um, they're different. They're different issues. Um, a large part of the population that is using the spice is, uh, are homeless individuals. Some of them transient, um, but mostly homeless people that we're dealing with. Um, significant. The gang issues that we grapple with, and as you know, the two gangs that we have in the city that uh, roughly have the nexus going back about two and a half years. Um, you know, these are people that you know went to school together. Most of them are local young people that grew up and grew up in our school system. Um, as you can see, the uh, one of the arrests we made. Um, regarding uh, the lone gang-related homicide that we had in the city this year was a local young man um, that went to one of our local schools. But that nexus for those two and a half years, how they started, they started out 
arguing over a variety of different things, some music, sometimes it was girls, et cetera, and it's exacerbated and it's grown you know, over the last two and a half years. Um, we, as a police department, have investigated and closed virtually 100% of all those violence-related cases. Um, I understand the angst of people. We use every investigative means and every resource that we have under our disposal. Um, not to get into particulars and operational um, OPSEC things, uh, but we are very good at that. The national rate for closure for homicide is about 55, 60 percent. We're at 100 percent. Um, does it make it good? Because the loss of life for anyone is tragic. That's someone's child, brother, sister, you know, or whatever it is. Doesn't matter what it is, regardless of what they've been involved in or what happened during that particular case. That's a loss of life. That's tragic. Um, but we'll continue to try to bring violators of the law to justice, um, and we use our uh, investigative prowess to do so. Um, but again, um, it's a continue. Uh, it's a continuation how we deploy our people. Um, but I'll, let me just kind of circle back to the spice thing. The spice thing is um, is very labor intensive. Um, the most probably frustrating part for me and the members of the police department is that it takes us away from the things that you know we really truly want to be involved in and we haven't stopped but it takes us away from all the proactive things that we've developed and and those type of things um, that's a difficulty but it takes much more than the police department to solve those issues you know much more um, we can arrest our way out of a situation we will make an arrest, you know. You know, um, we're great communicators, but can we also put people in the book too. Can you yeah. circle back to the heroin versus the spice? Sure. Because uh, um, again, I think people sort of just lump those under the same roof. Yeah, they're they're different. Uh, they're different chemical compounds. Um, they both have addictive qualities. Um, the spices is, is is very readily available. It's very cheap as is heroin. Marijuana is more expensive. They're different, they're different things. Um, but do you find it being the same, again, you get back to those numbers, do you find it being the same 20 people that are associated with both items? We do have a lot of overlap, yes. Okay. We do have a lot of the same people that, uh, that have overdosed repeatedly. You know, I think last year there was a time where we administered Narcan to an individual, I think it was five times in about eight days, you know, and we revived them. Um, Washington County, is the second largest county in the state of Maryland that are Nar Narcan trained. That includes the police department, fire, rescue, other members of the community. Which that is why our overdoses are down. And I think that's important to continue to yeah. drill to the public because I think there's a misconception that the problem is going away. And yeah. you've mentioned it a couple times. The problem is not going away. People are saving themselves. I carry Narcan, a lot of people carry Narcan. There are 145,000 people in Washington County, and we're second to Baltimore County or Baltimore City that's got 650,000 people. That's a problem. Yeah, it's, so, the, the problem hasn't gone away, and, so, I, and I mentioned that. You're right. The problem has not gone away. So I think we, and I don't know if others do, but I think we, and, and again, these questions that this individual sent me, you know, uh, to respond to for, for their class, you know, I think pointed to this. Uh, uh, particular case and it's a question I brought up about a year ago I think we had like 51 overdoses uh, uh, you know and, and there was a discussion about it and I think you know uh, Sheriff Mullendorf said you know 26 or 27 of those 51 last year at that point in time were outside of the city and I think there's this you know one of the questions in there was you know what's Hagerstown doing about the opioid crisis and I'm thinking to myself it's as if folks have this perception that if if I suddenly step over this magical city boundary line in Washington County that I'm suddenly going to be, you know, uh, 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 free of this issue and that it only exists when you step over that city boundary. And so, you know, you, 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 you reference those cases and I think there is this uh, unfortunate misconception that, that somehow this solely and squarely rests with the city uh, to solve. The incorrect, I mean, Washington County, you know, has their share of fatals and non-fatals. Um, 
Uh, matter of fact, the, you know, the sheriff and I sit on the board of the National um, the Narcotics Task Force, the Washington County Task Force. Yeah, like I responded, this is a problem from Chambersburg to Martinsburg. I mean, it's not it's, even just... I, I will, I will even go even a step further. Go down it, it's, and, and, uh, and I'll, let me extrapolate that out a little bit. It's not a problem that's indigenous to the city of Hagerstown, Washington County, or the other 23 counties in the state of Maryland. It's not a problem East Coast, Middle America, West Coast, North or South. It's a national major epidemic. I guess for me, in That's, terms of, yes. of, of utilizing your, your what I would call uh, interagency resources mm -hmm. with your closest counterparts mm -hmm. uh, as it applies to, to addressing um, uh, the similar individuals within that area. Mm -hmm. that, I guess that's how I sort of quantify that, that and we do. Know, space. And we do. We, you know, um, the individuals have a lot of overlap for whether it be here, Pennsylvania, West Virginia, mm -hmm. um, and there's a nexus. Again, um, every heroin overdose, we investigate every one, you know, um, every one. And, and again, we're looking for uh, investigative leads to pursue. Um, but by no means is this a problem, particularly heroin addiction, in the, in the city of Hagerstown? Um, absolutely no means. There's over, almost 2,000 overdose deaths in the state of Maryland alone, you know, um, in 2016. Uh, that's incredible. We're not, uh, we're, it's not a problem indigenous. I'm mm -hmm. sorry, council member. No, go ahead. Sorry. No, it's, 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 it's a problem that is so wide ranging and ingrained in our society it's something that yet I've ever, never seen. Um, it affects, it doesn't matter, you know, this, you know, crack cocaine um, was an incredible scourge on our society. Um, but there are a lot of crack, a lot of crack cocaine was a lot of, uh, even though it, it trickled out in, in, into the communities and the suburbs, mainly a, there were a lot of times it was a big city issue, but you know, I could go on and on about the crack cocaine epidemic. Heroin, it transforms every segment of our community. It doesn't matter if you have a lot or if you have nothing. It touches everybody. Um, it touches the people that are uh, great pillars of our community and people that have no pillar. Um, it's, it's an incredible um, drain, um, an incredible problem that we have in our community. I'm sorry. I just, I would like to refer back to the email that I sent, but I think it is incredibly unfair to put this all on you and the police department because it's not, you guys are doing your job. Who's not doing their job is Washington County, all, all of us involved in this because realistically, we're not doing anything to help. We have a, a major drug problem. And yes, the rest of Maryland does, the rest of the country does, but other counties and other, other places are taking steps to resolve this issue to make sure that the people who actually do want help have places to go. And we are sitting around watching this happen and watching this get worse month by month by month by month, and no one is doing anything about it. And I think it's time we need to sit down as a municipality that is affecting us greatly, but also with the county, and say, how are we going to resolve this? Because it's not just your problem. It's our problem. It's everyone's problem. And right now, when someone, yeah, there are a lot of people who don't want help, and I understand that, and, and that's their problem. But there are a lot of people that do, and we can't solve a problem by doing nothing about it, and we can't put it on the police. You can't save people. So what do we do about the people who don't want help, that they have to respond to, or HFD, or, or EMS? Can, can, I, can I just add something to that? And, and that's a great question. Police agencies are the ultimate social service agency. We're 24, that's just the way, way it is. We're 24 seven. When people don't know who to call, who do they call? They call the police department. It's not Ghostbusters. Yeah, I know, you know, we, you know when, we, when people don't know who to call, they call us, regardless of our, regardless of our position. We are, uh, we wear many, many hats. And, you know, when people don't want help, I understand that's frustrating for you as a body, as citizens, when they see people that continue to reoffend. But as a society, when we get to the point where we say, oh, well, forget them and just let them expire, for lack of better words. Right, these are humans, they're people. Yeah, absolutely, they're human beings. You know, when we get to that point as a society where you just say, okay, forget that individual, um, we're in a bad place. You know, and I'm not, not, you know, and I'm in no way, shape, or form suggesting that. Yeah. I'm just saying, what do we do about those individuals who don't want help, who don't want to seek help, who want to continue a lifestyle that they have, whether 
it's good for them or not, or they're for their family or for their relatives or extended family. What do we do about those individuals? That's I mean, not the case with most people, though. Most people do want help. They may not want it right after they get Narcan and they're withdrawing and puking and don't want somebody with a badge and a gun around them. It's a different scenario when you're waking up in a hospital. A lot of people don't want help at that point. But that doesn't mean throughout the weeks of their life that they don't realize they're making really bad decisions and want to get help. I'm not saying everyone does, but I think a lot of the you know, when you're in a hospital and you have a narcotics task force agent there questioning you and you've just woken up and you're sick and everything else, the perception is a lot of people don't want help. But when they go home and they're withdrawing again at home and realizing that they're losing everything or stealing from their parents or all the other things that happen with addiction, they want help. And there's, we don't have the resources to help them. That's a county problem. It is a local problem that we need to solve, that the county needs to solve, not that the police need to solve. Well, I think that, that using the city and the county as the two entities, to me, is fairly generic. Because, you know, we're, we're not the social uh, 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 agencies that are directly associated with administering that care um, and management and resources uh, often uh, aligned uh, directly with uh, a lot of individuals. Um, any more than, 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 you know, one of the questions that, that I got was, you know, you know, what's the hospital doing about it? I don't know, because we're not the hospital. Mm -hmm. You know, but everybody, I think, has this assumption that, well, you're the government, so you must sort of operate and run all of these social-oriented uh, sure. uh, uh, services. And, you know, we, we run a, you know, 99% of, of, of uh, uh, entities that provide that that you know assistance in whatever form it exists currently in this community uh, uh, are not under the auspices of the city of Hagerstown, uh, even though there's this misnomer that it may be, or or even under the auspices of the county. Sure. Uh, uh, frankly, and you know, and the difficulty I think that that that, that I have is, and I think you pointed it out when you talked about uh, your, your your prior service and and uh, you know the crack cocaine. Um, uh, era was getting those other what I would deem community partners and primarily the social service entities that are more directly uh, um, uh, associated um, involved uh, and involved in a meaningful way uh, because you know for me and, and Bob you talk about you know, well, you know what do you do for the individual that doesn't want help and I hear you know I hear what you're saying that that, that individual you know may not have that, that, that uh, uh, you know, uh, disposition at that moment, but, you know, I'll give you an example. Uh, the last two occasions, I've, uh, a gentleman that, that, that I've, uh, you know, uh, had to, to, to attend uh, with, you know, go to the hospital with uh, on, on an emergency basis. And on both occasions, on both occasions, um, you know, um, uh, it was in an emergency nature go in, you're sitting there, and you're there for like four hours. And the, the, it is abundantly apparent that the, the nursing staff and, and those, you know, sort of in those emergency, you know, uh, room operations uh, are committing a uh, more noticeable degree of time and resources to individuals in that state that are being brought in simply because of, of that, you know, uh, uh, the disposition of that individual being brought in in that condition, you know, and, and, uh, and, and frankly to the detriment of, of the individual that, you know, that, 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 that is not brought in under those circumstances. And, and it is, it, it is uh, uh, you know, uh, I think in the average person's view, a sort of lopsided, uh, uh, um, you know, perspective, because I'm like, man, you know, I, I really, you know, want the person I'm here with to, 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 to be getting the care for, you know, the emergency condition that they were brought in under, but it, it you know, when individuals are brought in in different states, uh, as you point out, and, you know, sometimes in, in, in bizarre fashion, you know, they're having to devote a, a sort of larger level of resource to that particular moment, and, and, and I think that's the kind of stuff that the community sees, and I, and I don't think that they see it in a manner to say, well, you know, you, you just let that individual go and, you know, lock them in a room, you know, and, 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 but, but rather, 
how do you how do you separate it in an appropriate fashion where you're still able to distribute that equal care? If we had proper uh, resource think, centers, we would be able to do that though, because then people could go. Those are in, in, important questions. Your question, the mayor's question. What do you do with people that don't want help? That's the hundred thousand dollar question. I wish I had the answer to it. Um, the answer is much more than a law enforcement response because we will never arrest our way out of it no, it's impossible it just won't happen and i will tell you today and i'll tell you tomorrow morning and i'll sit, sit on the top of the roof at midnight and tell you it will never happen through a purely an arrest mode you know we will take and we will continue to be strong on the enforcement end and take the people that need to be addressed when they bring the poison in and they distribute that that's important. The end user, the addict, that's the $60,000 question, $100,000 question, whatever it may be. It's incredibly difficult um, when people don't want to have, you know, wanna, don't want to help themselves. You know, um, matter of fact, I'm, I'm working very hard now with members of the police department to continue to keep them from being jaded you know, about, you know, continue coming across the same individual over and over again that does not want help, that keeps, you know, overdosing um, and understanding is that that's a human life, you know, but it's hard when you see the same thing day in and day out and you have that personal exposure. And it goes to your question, you know, when you go to Meredith, you go to a health facility, think about all the resources we spend on some of the overdoses we've had, particularly in the last next six weeks. Mm -hmm. It's very concerning to me is that we're spending a lot of time on these overdoses, but guess what? What if have someone has a stroke or a heart attack or in a serious accident and those resources are diverted? That's right. a problem. You know, the, uh, that's a big problem. And, you know, and I, and I, and I know. think that, and I think that it's incumbent upon us to have that, that type of honest conversation yes. with our providers that, 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 that frankly serve individuals uh, and, 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 you know, whether they, Sure. you know originate or whether they originate that 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 uh, you know affliction within the community or outside of you know i think that that we need to have <laughs> some modicum of self-awareness mm -hmm. as a community of you know to what degree we're adequately able and equipped to 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 provide for and address that and uh you know uh it, it, it's just odd to me that that we sort of establish and 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 you know look toward those benchmarks on virtually every service component we have uh, uh, and not this one and we don't have that communication at least in my mind we don't have that communication with you know uh, the broader spectrum of, of, of agencies that that, that you know um, uh, provide that broad array of, 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 of service delivery. It's just, and you're right, and, and, and it falls it's back to the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, and it falls back to uh, uh, Washington County Health Department, and it falls back to those entities that actually have, and, and they may not currently have the resources, and I understand that, but have the ability to get the resources to be able to, to do what you suggest. And, and, and not I mean, by themselves, but in conjunction with other people, to too. Fix it. You, you have to try to fix the problem. The problem is we have a drug problem, and we need to start asking ourselves, what are we doing to fix it? Are we in Washington County Schools? No. Do we have the proper resources? No. Is anyone getting together in the same room and saying, this is what the county is going to do, this is what this is going to do? No. I thought you, you did that a couple Well, I did do that, and I'm, well, I have well, a lot of information to give to that. Somebody's got to do it, and I've dedicated myself to being the one oh, to do oh, it. But oh, I'm oh, saying oh. As, as a county, you have, like, there, there's no education going on. There's no marketing campaign. Other counties have gone, and I'm, I mean the county as a whole. I'm talking about everyone, not county commissioners. I'm talking in general. Look at Hartford County. Look at Anne Arundel County. They took steps to solve the problem. I'm asking, what is Washington County doing to solve this problem? Not a lot, and it's a big problem. You can't, you can't, we can't just well, snap our is, fingers. But what are Anne Arundel County and Harper County doing? They have all kinds of initiatives going on. You can walk in any fire station, and, and they have a list of procedures. They all have sober houses and detox centers and, and, and places to go to get help where you can just walk in and get help. Here, if you walk into your ho our hospital and say, I'm an addict, I need to be admitted, you can't be admitted. 
I mean, where are you supposed to go? We can't start solving the problem until there's somewhere for people to go to get help and resources available. Who pays for those? The state. Oh, there's all kinds of money. Governor Hogan, $10 million. That's why I held that summit, so we can get in a position to start getting some of that money. I mean, the pro if, if someone comes to you right now and says, I'm an, I'm an addict, where do I go? Do you know where to send them? Do you know where to send them? Does anybody know where to send them? That's a problem. No, there should no. be there should be processes that we know. So if someone comes to you and needs help, they know where to get it. If someone comes to someone in the city, someone in the county comes to you, that we know what to do in that process. And we don't have that process right now. That's a problem. It is. But even in the instances where, where that service availability exists, uh, we need to reconcile some, some balance between making sure that availability uh, is actually there uh, uh, as it conflicts with, you know, uh, interests of, of, of that entity, you know, uh, having client. In other words, Let's say tomorrow. Let's say tomorrow we, we say, okay, we're, we're going to have this, this, this specific location and it's going to have, you know, it's going it's to be available for 50 individuals. And this, this private entity is going, going to, 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 to operate it. And I'm sure that there are a number of these uh, on, on a much more private scale, on a much smaller scale, uh, uh, right now. Um, but if the impetus of, of, of that process is, and, and pe people can argue with me all day that this doesn't exist, but I would contend otherwise, I think it does, <laughs> that, 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 you know, a, a court system somewhere else says, okay, Mr. Smith, you know, you have this issue, you're going to go over to this place, uh, you know, and, and so, so you know, whether, like I said, you know, anywhere in the tri-state area, anywhere in the state of Maryland, uh, individuals get, get, get uh, placed, you know, uh, uh, you know, within the well, we say it all the time. They come up here, to and I guess my question is, like, well, if there were fifty beds made available tomorrow, what there there must be some requisite in place that says these fifty beds are available to address the concerns that you're having, to address the fact that folks from this community are going in to the hospital within this community, saying, "Hey, you know, where can I go?" It can't be it, the solution. Can't be that you create. You know, the the these entities with these beds at these locations, and what continues to occur is 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 they remain full uh, uh, through through a process that 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 adds individuals with those afflictions to the community. You know what I mean? Uh, while while you don't have that availability, like I feel like that type of conversation hasn't occurred or isn't occurring to the degree that it likely should among the existing community partners that exist in this community now. It, that's a, uh, an issue, and again, uh, the whole drug epidemic that we have in our community and, and throughout the region is, is a systemic one. Uh, law enforcement is, uh, if anything, maybe a tenth of that whole process. Um, I agree. You know, and there's just so much, it's so much larger than the PD. I can tell you here from our perspective is that we'll continue to try to help people. And we will continue to arrest violators of the law. We will continue to do that. But uh, those two things work in tandem. We help people and we arrest people for violation of the law. We're not, we don't put our head in the sand and we're not, we're not soft on anything. But we also we want to help people too. You know, because we recognize that the part of the problem and part of the issue is that, you know, we want we don't want uh, an arrest is a is an avenue of last resort for us. Um, we'll make that arrest um, because we, you know our core function is to protect our community and keep our community safe and make it resilient. Um, that's incredibly important for us. So it's uh, this is an enormous question for us, and as Councilmember Keller said, it, it involves so many so many different people um, but we're going to continue until we uh, whatever it is whatever the process is for us because we'll never relent you yes touch on that? yes the um, 
the paper that I gave to you uh, in regards to the Good Samaritan Act, and I think I touched on it just a little bit, but it precludes us from doing a lot of things. In a medical emergency, quite frankly, CRS comes on the scene, we come on the scene, fire department comes on the scene. Individual um, is passed out um, and is experiencing an overdose, whether or not it's heroin, spice, marijuana, or, and or alcohol. Um, unless a felony has been committed and it's just an overdose situation, we are prohibited from making that, you know, um, that arrest. It's a Good Samaritan law. And it covers, enumerates a lot of different things, um, whether it be possessing or administering CDS, drug paraphernalia, controlled paraphernalia, underage drinking, um, alcohol. So it, it gives us, um, we're precluded from a lot of different things that we can do under the law regarding to a sheer possession and a sheer overdose case. It does not have anything to do if we're, we're investigating a felony and or does not stop our investigative process. Anytime an individual is on the street, we attempt, uh, attempt always to get information to further our investigation regarding the people that are bringing this in. Um, oftentimes, people are very uncooperative with us and they won't talk to us. You know, yeah, you know, oftentimes. But you know, we try to, just like anything, just in any case we do, whether it be um, a serious part one crime, whether it be burglary, robbery, shooting, even homicide, we attempt to build that relationship with people because where we get information is from people. Um, and if you treat people correctly, for the most part, most of the cases I can tell you in the city that we've closed and we've closed very quickly is because we built a relationship with people, you know, um, and we've been able to get information um, and people help us, you know, very much so. It's no different with overdoses. It's no different with any of those cases. But um, the Good Samaritan Act, uh, it prohibits us from doing a lot of different things. You know, and most people will think that, you know, somebody's got, you know, spice on them, they have paraphernalia on them, they have marijuana, heroin, or whatever, and they've overdosed, well, you can lock them up. If they're and you can't write them a citation? No. Not, not, you can't do um, anything? No. It's very, very difficult for us to do anything. Um, but again, it doesn't stop us from questioning and investigating. We send an investigator out for every heroin overdose. We talk to everybody. Um, and we talk to whether we get cooperation or not. Um, that does not, we will not relent in that regard. Even if it's a felony, we're still going to charge you with it. You know, um, but when it comes down to these uh, statutory misdemeanors and, and the misdemeanors we have here, it's very difficult. So we have limitations what we can do with a medical overdose. You know, we have extreme limitations with what we can do with that. Um, general public may think that we can, you know, summarily make an arrest, you know, if somebody has something on. We just can't. Um, but again, and I have to emphasize, it doesn't stop us from investigating. It does not uh, stop from, you know, us pursuing, you know, the end, uh, the person that's bringing, uh, or persons that are bringing in poison in our community. We won't relent on that, and we're very good at it. You know, but we try to get, we try to get cooperation. Sometimes we don't. Um, it's Paul, a, you had something you wanted to ask, I think, again, from Tom and from Connor. No, I didn't want to cut in while I No, please, I'm done. Um, just a couple things. I mean, first off, I think a lot of things have been discussed here. First off, I, I agree with, with Councilwoman Keller as far as this, this is, I know it falls on your doorstep first. Sure. I think it's by a lot of people to the police and uh, Chief Lohr. Um, but obviously no one is putting this on the police or fire department. Obviously, as you said, this is a, an issue um, much broader than that. Um, you know, the, the 81 overdose doses you cited by 23 individuals mm -hmm. is a larger problem inside the problem. Sure. Um, likewise, I, with the um, police calls and fire department calls I saw last week, I would think the fire department ones, there was probably 80% of them were medical emergency, medical emergency, medical emergency, medical emergency, and same as a lot that you guys sure. are getting. And by, by no means do I feel that we don't need the resources and the help for people that want to have that help. But I got to tell you, Councilman Keller, to sit here and say that nothing is being done is completely disingenuous to our local delegation, our state delegation, to our governor. You said yourself, there's $10 million been allocated. So I know things may not be moving as fast as you may like them to, but to sit here and say nothing is being done, um, I think is counterproductive to the, to the effort as a whole. I'm more concerned right now well, what we can do in the city of Hagerstown as far as some of these individuals that the mayor alluded to that don't want help, that are not even, you know, entertaining any type of assistance from you. Um, 
what, you know, Kristen brings it up a lot in the different communications that go around. What services are these folks receiving? Where are they from? Are they local? Are they transient? Are they, um, you know, what, what other ordinances do we have that we can use as far as, you know, the crime-free ordinance, things of that nature? Because, I mean, if, at the end of the day, if folks don't want to help themselves, we're, we're, it's an uphill battle. It's, it's, it's not going to happen. Yeah, but a police officer arresting can't, someone or an overdose call can't say, are you on welfare? What services are you providing? I don't, like, we get asked that question all the time, and I'm still trying to figure out what difference that makes. How, well, I mean, we can't for do a fact, if they get arrested, and <laughs> there's, I mean, that, well, that's what I think we need to look at as far as some of these things, because if folks don't want to <laughs> assimilate with society in our community, you know, they're, they're free to go back to wherever they came from. Well, they're, they're not stray cats. We can't just put them on a bus and ship them out hey, somewhere. I'll drive the bus. If they're from Baltimore, if they're from PG County, wherever they're from, you know, not singling out those particular areas. But how, though? How? I mean, how is that? That's not how. That, well, I think I, it's I, a we get these emails have. every time a, a press release goes out. All these people using services, are they from here? I guess my question is why does it matter? Because, because what, these services say, are attracting those folks and so, keeping those folks here. But how you can't get, how do you just. I guess I don't understand the point of finding that out because what can you do about it? If someone's on welfare, we can't say, well, you can't come to Hagerstown anymore. Or if someone says, well, I moved here from Baltimore, we can't say go back to Baltimore. But we don't That's need not. to continue to enable the proliferation of those services, which in turn brings an increased issue. That's just my thoughts. So, I, I, mean, I just don't I mean, understand we're gonna how we're enabling there. it. I could let me just add a couple things that's from, what I don't if understand. I can from a law enforcement perspective um, services that people get all due respect it's not in the purview of the police oh, department you know, absolutely um, where people come from the Constitution allows people to move from Portland Oregon to here or anywhere mm -hmm. else that's not germane unless it's germane to an investigation where somebody comes from it's it's not the purview of the police department it's unconstitutional I understand your absolutely understand your point, but from a law enforcement perspective, it's not a question we'd ever ask, nor would we ever be involved in. Um, it's, uh, and I understand people's understanding a uh, uh, point on that particular thing, but from our perspective, we look at criminal behavior solely, you know, and what's allowed, what we're allowed to do under the Constitution, whether it be the First Amendment, Fourth Amendment, etc. Particularly the Fourth Amendment for us, but. Um, those are in, in, incredible things, and you know, and, and uh, for us, we look at be criminal behavior and what we can do um, as an agency. And I, I don't think you're in, in, in mentioning that it's something that we should do as an agency, but city services and what people get, it's not germane to our function. No, I didn't intend that yeah, at all. Yeah, um, and I understand, and, and I understand that, and where people reside and where they come from, and you know, unless it's there's a direct connection to a criminal investigation. Um, and it's germane to something. Um, we'll look at that, you know, because you know we do have pipelines from different areas of the community um, segments that we look at. Uh, but that's all we look at, you know, in regard to criminality. You you had mentioned that you follow up uh, uh, on on heroin overdose. Yes. Know, do you follow up on spice overdose? Yes, we try. We try to. Um, and, and 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 given that, then you know where the individual is and, and those kind of things. Um, and getting back to something that Krista said, I mean, isn't there an avenue through the crime-free housing ordinance that, you know, makes that individual a violator of that ordinance by being associated with that address? If we were to get a call to their address, an address they reside, most of the people are homeless that we're dealing with. I understand. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. not everybody's homeless. Not everybody, but if we have a case and we're, we have a case that we can make through the crime-free ordinance, we, we yeah, enforce we, it. We you know, we, we enforce okay. it. Um, you know, and we use the crime-free ordinance, as a matter of fact, pretty handily in a variety of different cases, okay. if we can use it. Um, well, that's why I'm asking. Yeah. I, I don't know if we're doing that with overdoses is why I'm asking. Absolutely we do. If we get a call for service, um, if we serve a warrant in those houses, there's multiple addresses throughout this community. Okay, but if Joe, whatever his face is, passes out on South Potomac Street, lives on Prospect Street, it's not germane to the crime-free ordinance. Right. There's nothing there. It's not germane. If he passes out on the sidewalk and he's down on in the square or wherever, wherever that, unless it ha the crime-free ordinance has to be associated 
with that house, with our call for service at that residence. And, um, and that's how we enforce it. That's how we enforce it. But we're, there's multiple addresses that we have had calls for services. Um, and we've served warrants regarding to spice and overdose, uh, spice and heroin, where we've utilized the crime-free ordinance. Um, and we've utilized it uh, very effectively, very effectively. So I'm, I'm very happy how we've done that. But again, that's a process. I mean, we just had two come over my desk today citing and finding people for you know, their lack of cooperation in our process. Um, we use every tool, you know, we use every tool that we have. Um, we've no trespass people um, when we have. We get people, we've uh, written citations for that. Um, uh, we have done, we've used no trespassing. We've used every tool that we have and every tool we can think of. And we continue to try to look at tools we can um, to get the message across. Uh, but it's difficult. And it goes back to your core question. Some individuals want no help. They seek no help. And um, unfortunately, they don't care about their own well-being. And that's just a fact of the matter. Um, and uh, so we try to do the best we can with what the resources we have allocated. But we well, I do. appreciate this update. Does anybody else have any questions? For Just for comment. Sure. Thank you. Thank you and your agency for what you do yeah. in an absolutely impossible situation. It, it's, I told you last, last week, you know, I, this is, being in law enforcement is not a job for me. It's part of what, you know, I, I live and breathe. It's part of my DNA. Even I, have I, I, you know, I, I do this job because I try to make a difference in everything we can. Right. I understand everybody's frustration. I understand the frustration of the things that we deal with. I'm equally frustrated. But I'm not going to be the glass half full guy. I'm just not going to be that guy. I'm going to try to always find the glass half full solution through enforcement, through outreach and through all the means that we have everybody together. Um, I, I couldn't sleep if I did, if I, if I just gave up. I won't give up. It's an impossible situation sometimes. But you know what? Um, through impossibilities become successes. You know, and if you keep trying, I won't give up. Our agency won't give up. And that's why we hired you to be chief of police. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Well, I have to say that it looks like you at least had a Somewhat quiet weekend with only three heroin ODs and six place ODs. Can you, can you please? Most definitely. Everybody, please. Yeah. Yeah. So. Um, I will tell you um, here today, uh, and you'll see it tonight, so I'm not telling you anything out of school. Um, we had uh, two bank robberies in the city um, Walmart, and then the, I think the BBT, and then one out in the county. Through our investigative means and processes, uh, we have uh, apprehended those individuals um, in another county, and uh, we've been working that case for a while. There have been more, more, multiple cases. We had one at Bull, uh, uh, what's uh, Bulldog. 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 It's a very funny name for a credit union. Um, Bulldog <coughs> Credit Union. Uh, that today, I will tell you today, we'll close that too. Um, but we closed the one, the the three that we had, and. Um, in conjunction not only with our detectives, um, I, I got to tell you, I'm incredibly proud of our, uh, our folks. Incredible. They worked tirelessly on this case. And we were able to use investigative means um, to determine who they are. And you'll see their faces soon, you know, in the news. You know, you'll see them. But uh, that was great work for uh, HPD in our collaboration because we had to work with a couple other counties because they, where the apprehension was made. And you'll see that um, very shortly in a press release. Thank you, Chief. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. I'm not giving up, folks. I'm not giving up. Don't expect you to. I'm not giving up. I am. Too important. Too important for the safety of every neighborhood in this community. Um, I enjoy thoroughly working with all of you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Chief. Thank you. All right. Uh, city Administrator's comments? Nothing tonight. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. A couple quick ones. First, I want to point this out. Uh, Main Street, the program Main Street has a lot of volunteers and they do a lot of good work. But on Saturday, as Emily knows, they were especially busy in downtown Hagerstown where they did uh, some plantings. Now the temperature Saturday, if I remember correctly, reached 
85 or 90 degrees. Uh, these people were out there sweating and working and digging in dirt and making a real difference in the beautification and the appeal of downtown Hagerstown. And they deserve exceptional credit for what they accomplished. Uh, I've looked, walked around everything they've done and it's, and it's great. And I know that Emily showed up, she was there, and uh, I, it was just a very good thing for those volunteers to do. And secondly, uh, Sunday night, I went to um, the municipal band. Uh, it was a great show, the first one of the season. Just prior to the band, the Elks Club put on a, f a flag day program. It was very, very professional. And um, our band uh, had been involved in, in competitions, including in Williamsport, uh, where our city clerk's from, uh, all day long. So by the time they started that concert, it had been a, already been a long, hot day for them. And I wanted to point out one thing. There was a, one of the band members did a saxophone solo, uh, and I can't remember the name, although I'm kind of thinking it was a Mr. Lemon, and it was a, one of the most incredible saxophone solos I have ever heard in my life. It was spectacular. It was a great evening at City Park. Thank you, Mayor. Paul. No comments. Emily. Nothing other than I hope to see everyone at the Cultural Trail grand opening this when Saturday at 2 o'clock. What is that? When? when? Oh, Saturday. Saturday at 2. Saturday. 2 to 5. 2 to 5. Well, I think it's like, it's 12 it's 12 actually, well, yeah, it's like 12 to 5, but yeah. the, 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 opening the ceremony is And that'll be two. down in front of the mural. Well, we as a body will meet anywhere size. particular specific time. In front of the mural. Yeah. It's front of the mural, 2 o'clock. Yeah, right? the mural. Yeah. Yeah. Mural. Unfortunately, yeah. I am not going to be able to make it. I'm out of town. I'll take you to the Yes. Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, honestly, I uh, I'm, my, mine are going to be very quick. I appreciate the chief's update. I appreciate the information. I I, I agree wholeheartedly with you, Emily. Um, I, I know it may sound like I don't, but I do. So I, I just know that it's it's got to start somewhere, and it can't be all us. That's all I'm saying. It's it's got to be collaborative effort with all these agencies that you had at your summit and and more uh, you know and we've got to find a way and the state of Maryland has to help uh, because we're all residents of the state of Maryland so uh, but I, I appreciate your effort I really truly do um, I look forward to seeing everybody on Saturday down at the cultural trail and I know that I uh, at times uh, have have uh, appeared to be negative I will tell you this. I know that there are, are, are options for us with that cultural trail and everything that's going on down there, and we need to make sure that we capitalize on every single one to drive as much traffic, to drive as many people along that trail into that area that, that we possibly can because that's what will make it successful. So we have to make sure we do more events and those kind of things along that trail to be able to drive people there. So, And it'll make it appear safer whether it is or not. It doesn't matter because you have more people. So, that's all I have. Good night and thank you very much. We'll see you next week. Chief, you got an update on the day out, of, out in uh, uh, 81 North?